All right, thank you. And there he is. Hello, Mr. Franklin. <laughs> All right, as, I, as my understanding is, we don't have any board or commission interviews, no. but we have less to talk about. So rather than doing the appointments, I think we'll go ahead and have at the item number five, I think we'll go ahead and do that now, if you all don't mind, so that then the produce group is finished. I don't forget to do that. It's really about me keeping track of things. So um, if you will recall, thank you. Um, if you will recall, Brandy Grant interviewed for the Police Community Engagement Board, um, and there was the residency requirement issue. Um, city clerk consulted with the city attorney who confirmed that we could appoint Ms. Grant to the PCDB as an ad hoc member, and she could be voting while serving in that, that capacity once she's been a resident for a full year then we simply elevate her to a full member if people would like to do that. Because to my knowledge, we do not have another application. So she, she can vote? Can. If we decide she can, she can. Okay. Does anyone have? Yeah, go ahead. So what makes her ad hoc? Just because we're in the so at this point, you're, you're appointing her sort of as a fill-in spot. It, it, it is not a... Uh, full appointment to the commission because she doesn't qualify there, but realistically, practically, it accomplishes the same purpose. Okay. So basically, it takes advantage of her skills, it takes advantage of her experiences, allows the committee to utilize them. And it, again, because it serves only in an advisory capacity and it can only make recommendations, there's there's no problem. With it. So she cannot vote. She can. She, she can. can. Yes. Okay. And we have done this before with Don Brewster on sustainability and quality. We've done it in the past. Mm -hmm. oh, and I guess that was another question. So if we, all of our committees are full, the commissions are full, if somebody wants to serve, we can make them also an ad hoc. You, you can. You can. You just want to pay attention, close attention to what that does to your voting and that sort of thing. So, so that's my other question. Mm -hmm. Does she count in uh, achieving a quorum? Yes. Good. Okay. Because that's an important uh, thing. Okay. Do you all ad hoc yeah. members or can you differentiate, like, we want you part of the quorum? We don't. So because because alternates can qualify for that and they're actually not formally sitting, I would say the ad hocs can too. It's a consistent theory. So yes, is the answer. It counts towards the court. Our commissions have a one-year residency requirement. No. I don't. Just that, this one. I was going to say, I don't think there's any others. I think it's just no. this one. Yeah. I, I think so it was special. written by a group of people. So I think that Thank you, Kate. All right. Is there any objection to uh, appointing Brandy Grant as an ad hoc voting member of the Police Community Engagement Board? No objection. Nope. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll move on to Historic, Hi, Karen. Hi. Historic Preservation Commission. We interviewed both Kevin Randich and Jason Vassar Elon. Elon? Elon. Elon. Um, so Mr. Randich said that he would be willing to serve as the alternate member of the Board of Adjustment or the Traffic Advisory Commission, whichever the place the city has the greatest needs, um, there are vacancies on both boards. Mr. Uh, Elong has said that he, if not appointed Historic Preservation Commission, would be interested in serving on the Arts Commission, which currently has nine members but may have up to 11 board members. So we can apply, we can appoint either of them to HBC and have other places to put whoever's not appointed. I'm sorry, Karen, to put you on the spot the minute you walked in, but I know that you were going to have some discussion with the membership of the HPC about whether they had any preference on the skill sets for each of these gentlemen. And when they reviewed, it was just the same. Like we said it was a toss-up. So it was like, do, do we have any um, indication if either one of them are interested in other roles? So that would be the topic. Okay. Um, does anybody have particular thoughts? Well, on their second choices, are any of those commissions ones that we need to fill spots on? So I have yes. behind me the chair of the Traffic Advisory Commission who mentioned in the meeting last night that they very much would like another member. So that certainly is one option. I remember, I remember one, was it Jason who had a PhD? Yeah, 
Well, if there are no strong feelings, might I suggest then that we we appoint Mr. Randish to the Traffic Advisory Commission, which does have that need, and um, he's willing to serve and go ahead and uh, appoint <laughs> Mr. Elong to the Historic Preservation Commission. Yes. Does that work for everybody? Yes, it does. Did, did we just have an, an Board of Adjustments? So that's just an alternate member. No, we had we had somebody who resigned from the Business Development Commission yeah. and somebody from Crossroads. My, it's in my memo. Yeah, Miss Katie. Yeah, there we go. Yep. Oh, good. I got that right. What do you know? All right. Uh, we have learned from the school district that the school board member for Parks and Recreation Commission, if we so choose, would be Tara Shear. We would formally appoint her. Joe Dahl has expressed some interest in participating and will attend some as well. Only one member is a voting member and they understand that. We okay with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Michael Johnson has served one term on the Parks and Recreation Commission. <laughs> and um, would like to be considered for reappointment and staff liaison has endorsed that as well. He's a good and participating member. Any objections? Yeah. All right, look at that. We got all our appointments yeah. taken care of tonight. Katie, are you relieved over there? <laughs> all right. Um, is there anything anyone would like to review on the regular agenda? All right, then we're gonna move on to updates. Uh, Payne, would you like to start? Sure. Quite a sustainability met yesterday, and uh, they are working on their priorities. They are uh, categorizing things they could work on their own, and things that require budget and staff time. So they are looking at it closely. Um, I've also met three times with a subcommittee that recently formed for composting, and uh, there's a survey out, out there composting, and I'll tell you why in a minute, but did you know that food waste is the single most common material set to landfills? It, it comprises 24% of municipal waste. Um, so Missouri Botanical Garden and Earth Day 365 have approached uh, Webster because we're a model uh, municipality about going for a grant, partnering with them for a grant from the USDA um, for composting in municipalities. So that um, is underway. The deadline is September 4th, and they've been having weekly meetings, a rigorous process. Um, and so we are close to the end of that. Um, but also on the encouragement of uh, Renee Tyler, uh, Sean Finnegan put up a composting survey, which is still available. It's on Facebook and Instagram, and we had 155 responses, and 72% said they would be interested in a community drop-off. Mm. So there's a lot of intricacies in it. Um, it has to do with multiple locations in the city for a drop-off. Um, they're also going to be partnering with Webster Rock Ministries and utilizing their kitchen and making that more robust production, community garden, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of different um, legs on this project, but it, it, it's looking good. So that's all I have. Great, thank you. Um, I'll go. Please do. Okay. Um, today is the first day of school for Webster Schools. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, yay school. Um, uh, the business, um, Development Commission, uh, they have their coffee that's on the 18th of September, um, and they also have a happy hour in Tierra. I don't know if you can remind me of the date. I couldn't find it. Thursday the 29th. Oh, gosh, you're here. I didn't, how what did I miss you? <laughs> Thank God you're here. I couldn't miss him. Thank you. Thursday the 29th. Next week, you're a lifesaver, Aaron. Um, so that's the, that's the happy hour. Happy hour. Yeah. And where is that? That's Coburn. Coburn? Sorry, what time did you say? What time? Thank, Thank you. My social coordinator. Thank you. 
Um, thank you for that. Um, they're also working on a unified like holiday communication um, branding thing. And that, so that'll be really cute and fun. And really just trying to work together on um, making a strong fourth quarter and making it super fun for, for the community and all of the region. Um, uh, and the I sat in on the Old Orchard um, Business District meeting and uh, their gazebo series is up and running um, on Friday nights um, at Gazebo Park. And that's what I have. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Well, my commissions have not met since the last council meeting, which I missed. Um, thank you. Pam and Laura for sitting in on Green Space and Planning Commission. Um, I did watch the updates from the last week. Uh, I didn't know, um, Peoples, do you, not to put you on spot, do you know if we got, um, I might have missed it in my email, got communication back from Public Works to Green Space on how greener cities going to work this year? We have not. We've communicated internally. We have okay. not communicated back. But there's actually more communication coming broader than okay. that topic. So that was kind of the one kind of note that I had hanging from yeah. um, council member Liz's update. I can't say it's not going away and was never going away. There was just some no like who's so doing cool. what and how that's working. I know they had their kickoff meeting last Saturday at Larson Park to um, kind of like the educational. Mm -hmm meeting to help with the tree stewards learn how to take care of their tree. It's a really great, great program because the um, the city pays for the tree, but the um, residents commit to stewarding or watering that tree for two years and then public works takes over. So it's kind of a nice um, hybrid partnership there. Um, so it's planning in green space. I think that's it. Other than to say, I saw a horse-drawn carriage in front of Robust on my way here. It was a special birthday party for one of our community members who not only has gone to her birthday in a horse-drawn carriage there, to her wedding reception as well. Oh, same my. wedding. So Very that, fun was a, that was a fun thing to see on the way. Yeah. It, sorry, it's not going to be a usual thing. That's <laughs> okay. It's so fun. We kind of like, you know, holiday things and, and stuff like that. Yeah. It's fun. It's fun. That's all yeah. I have. Uh, yeah, um, Historic Preservation Commission, we had a um, nice robust discussion uh, last week, and two things in particular that came up that um, the interest in, in having some type of conservation districts, they said they kind of talked about it before, but was actually recommended that they bring it up and consider it in conjunction with the comprehensive plan. And um, so, you know, my, my, my recommendation was that they make sure that they're attending listening sessions mm -hmm. and to bring that up. Um, and it was in, in really with the intent to try to pres preserve some of the quaintness and what have you of the, for example, the South Webster or North Webster or just even the, the West uh, the, the east side going down Marshall Place, just some of the communities where there's been such egregious change with them coming down and, and tearing the houses down. And then you get these huge houses next to them that block the sun, block the lights, block the wind, block everything. And um, so they just had some, some ideas about that. And so I really suggested that we make sure, first of all, is start looking at putting on paper what that looks like to them. And then two is making sure that they share that vision with the comprehensive plan because that would be something that I think we would want to incorporate into a comprehensive plan that we look like to talk about what we think the city should look like, what we'd like to see. The other one was um, a discussion about reviewing proposals for demolition, you know. Um, the quickness with which they have to respond to those. And right now, I think the, the understanding is that that's dictated by what's written in the ordinance about what the uh, uh, HPA can do and how quickly they need to respond. And they're just really wanting to know if there's, is, is there a way that they could have more time to consider and look at those. For example, they get them um, and, and 
a few days before a meeting and they have a few days to look at it and then they have to decide in a meeting as opposed to if they get them at a meeting, perhaps if they had time to review those and then make a decision at the next meeting. So um, I told them that I really think that, I mean, the ordinance, how the ordinance for the different commissions are based upon how we write them. We write those words, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, do we, or is that state law? That no, we, we, write that? That. we write those. Yeah, so we I kind of think if we write them, we can unwrite them. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that. Well, yeah, I know so that they, they do they, sometimes they, like <laughs> take a particular property and delay the vote on that one property to get more time to like do research and things like that. So they've done that when I was on it. I mean, probably you too. They, they do that several times. Well, so they'll decide on the relatively straightforward ones in the meeting. And then if there's one where they want to do some more historical digging, they'll delay that. Right. But I think that we need to consider in our ordinance, because I think that their understanding is that in the ordinance, there is a time um, so, requirement in there. So I was the liaison to the HBC when they came up with the current process. Mm -hmm. And at one point, if I can remember clearly enough, and this may just be a place to start, okay. there was some kind of flow chart that made it mm -hmm. really a lot easier to understand what went what could had to be voted on immediately, what went for review, what you could do inside the plan department versus what came to HPC. And so um, it might be a good place to start is to make sure that the commission will, walks through what that looks like. I mean, because then, yeah, you're right, we can change the ordinance. Mm -hmm. The question is what probably would like a specific request from them, I okay. think. And there have been quite a few newer members lately. We had some turnover. Right. So I'm not sure anybody. So that was a long time ago. <laughs> 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 that long ago. <laughs> okay. It was before COVID, so it was a very long time. Well, we were before times. Yeah. Karen, do you mind if I tack on to the conservation district to add a little bit to that? So they, that was talked about. They I have been talking about that for a while, and we we did say like let's wrap that into the comprehensive plan. I don't know if that got, I don't see it in the document that we have, you know, for today. So I don't know if that message got through. I know that they did attend some listing sessions and some different things. The idea being that like a neighborhood should be able to decide what that neighborhood looks like, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be like an HOA. It can just be like new construction needs to have brick or, you know, we don't want things that are more than a story and a half tall or right. whatever works for that particular group. And it would be something that that neighborhood would decide for that neighborhood rather than something that would be imposed on them. Um, so I thought it was a really interesting idea because it can be really, it can vary so much from neighborhood to neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be great if that was kind of wrapped into the comprehensive plan. I just don't know if that like that game of telephone, like, but uh, you know. Well, we have sure. some of our members of the team on, on the call right now. So yeah. I think we'll maybe can ask that question when we get to the presentation. I think we can, and I certainly don't know the answer, uh, but I will say they heard conflicting things from different groups. So mm -hmm. it may or may not be a great idea to all. And I feel like I think it's a great conversation piece. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about the presentation. How would it be enforced? That that is a problem, David, because you, you would have to have an appeal process built in. There would have to I mean, you'd have to have clear statements of what that is. Um, you know, and if you had 15 different groups in 15 different neighborhoods who were making their own decisions, having some consistency would be a very difficult issue. And wouldn't there have to, if, if there were agreement on what that is for, not, you know, what constitutes this conservation district, for example, then um, would then an ordinance be the way that you document what that is? The, the notice requirements and that sort of thing, you, you'd have to set that all out in, in, in the ordinances. It'd, have to be, uh -huh. it'd, it'd all be in the planning ordinances. Uh -huh. So we'd have to have you know, a list of how that works. And then if you were divided up by neighborhood, you'd have to have what the neighborhood boundaries are and where those lines are. And again, I, I think it would be hard to do. I think it would be very hard to do. Because I know a, a lot of the interest was around or concern around, you know, you, you have local in, or, or interest or what have you, but what, what you don't have is when you have builders mm -hmm. that come in and, and 
then, you know, they don't really care about what the local, what is they care about how much money they're going to make off of this piece of construction, you know, but then you end up in situations where this house is towering over this one. Now they, you know, they have no sun, they have no, so what can you do there to, you know? Well, there you're doing it on the front end, right? It has to be at the time that they're making the application to build whatever they're going right. to build. So, you know, again, and those are enforceable as long as they're clearly stated, as long as people know exactly what they have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, the, the, it, it can be enforced. Okay. The, the problem, as I say, is when you when you write something that is going to be kind of a quilt work so that you have multiple groups where the, where the, the standards in one area might be very different from another area that are just right across the street. Mm -hmm. that, that's when you get into problem areas. So that's where you get into problems with enforcement. Robert can tell you that that would be a very hard thing to do. So, uh, just one note that uh, the PCEB would not meet this month, uh, but they're planning on having a um, two hour meeting next month. Uh, we shared with them uh, what their goals and objectives would be for that group. And um, so we're going to have, a, I guess, a strategic planning meeting for the two hours to look to see where they are and where they want to go and what they can do. So uh, I did share with that committee, that board rather, that you know, <laughs> been in existence for what, three years, four years, and nothing has really come out of that, that board. So just working on the same things <clears throat> now as they did two, three years ago. So. Wasn't a happy group, but I was to the point. I just want to make sure they understood that you know we need to go somewhere with this instead of just me. So we'll do that. <clears throat> Excuse me, we'll do that in September. Katie, we're full now, right? You know, um, there is one vacancy for a doctor because Damn, um, question just to me about. <laughs> Um, so that'll be a little hard to put well, so if anybody knows a doctor. All right. right. And it's not, doesn't have to be a doctor, right? Isn't it a medical professional? A medical professional. Yeah. Okay. They mean to be a Webster resident? I think it does. Um, um, I don't think it's a, a business owner. It's not my resident. Oh, somebody will degree off the internet. <laughs> David, do you have any updates for us? No updates, Madam Mayor. Right. Yes, ma'am. It dovetails with the conference of plan. The last formal listening session is this Thursday at Rock Hill Ministries at 6 p.m. It is open to everybody. So please help us share that information. Uh, Lakota Group will be at this Friday's Gazebo Series doing a pop-up event, so people can also stop by and share things there. And then there'll be the, uh, early Friday morning at the school district meeting with students, which that, of course, is not open to everybody. They're, they're for specific. It'll be really neat. So that's all. Thank you. Would you like to introduce our two department directors who have joined us? Mm -hmm. You can do it in the other room, too, and you can stand up and everything, but... Absolutely. So... But anyway, yeah. They are. <laughs> we'll start where we're at. So this is Sinan, and he is our Public Works Director. Please. Well, my name is Sinan Alpasa. I'm very happy to be here uh, uh, to take on the responsibilities of the Public Works Department uh, and work on uh, improving projects and uh, ongoing services and make it a better place than uh, find it to be. But it's a, already a very nice community, as I uh, observed, and uh, very uh, uh, also participatory community. So uh, I have some experience in uh, municipal uh, public works uh, uh, administration and engineering uh, type of work. And uh, I worked in uh, University City Public Works Department before and, uh, and also have some experience from the uh, private sector uh, engineering. Uh, well, welcome. Welcome. Happy to have you. Day two. So oh, day you know, well, we might as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Again, anything. Okay, uh, started day one. Uh, so. Both of us started day two. So. Oh. Well, you had four days between the two of you. We're not new anymore. Matt. Robert Myers. Yeah. My name is Robert Myers, and uh, planning and development director. And previously, it was eleven years for St. Charles County 
planning uh, zoning division director, you know, where I managed a team of uh, six um, planners, both long range planning, current planning, permits, flood plan administration, uh, and uh, let's see, master planning, grants management. We had about, we are now, we had about $20 million in federal grants going through our small division, and it's a lot of work, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, previous to that, I worked for City of Urbana, Illinois for eight years. I was the planning manager there. Mm -hmm. Boards and commissions, I've attended a million boards and commission meetings, drafting ordinances. I was uh, speaking of historic preservation. That was my, I came from historic preservation, actually, started out there. In Illinois, I was the president of the Illinois Association of Historic Preservation Commissions, which was the group of 60 municipalities who were all uh, joined together for training opportunities. But anyway, there's different aspects, um, floodplain administration. There's lots of things I think that are applicable here. Yeah. <laughs> but like Sinan said, I really appreciate this very participatory um, Municipality, it's, it seems like, I mean, that's great. Welcome. 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 I know we had a lot of meetings. So. Yeah, yeah. 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 You can help us with that. Yeah. Mr. Bruntrager, anything from you? I wish I did, but I don't. Don't. All right. Well, I will wrap this up. Uh, I got notification this week about the very good neighbor week. We did that last year, allowed residents to nominate someone. If you all are so inclined, we'll do that again. It runs September 28th to October 4th. So we'll collect the first week of September nominations and then our, at our first October meeting, recognize people. Would you like to continue that? Yeah. Um, nominations come to me, so I, I, staff burden is, is minimal, I think. So uh, I went to TAC last night. We have a new chair, Mr. Clark O'Tailing. And Susan Sonderman is the new vice chair. Uh, Chris Redford is stepping out of the chair positions, but going to stay on the commission. So that's great. Uh, they also are thinking about their um, next uh, activities and, and what might be on their agenda for the remainder of the calendar year and into next year, um, based on those uh, the work plan they submitted. Um, I forwarded an email to all of you about an MSD luncheon series for local leaders. If um, you all would like to go, I know some of you have a lot of interest in what's going to happen with the money we all voted for in April. So please feel free to attend um, chair and vice chair meetings of boards and commissions. We're going to have one. This is something we did last fall. I don't know if Neil, you even know yet. Marie and I have decided that we're going to do one in September. <laughs> Yay! So please join us. <laughs> yes, ma'am. But just to work on, you know, management, um, staff capacity, and a lot on sunshine and open meetings and things like that, so that we're uh, doing well with that. Um, Boards and Commission's handbook. I emailed to you, and if you would like to review it, please do review it and um, get your comments back to me soon. We'd like to start distributing that when we meet with the chairs and vice chairs in September. And I think that's it for me in updates. Anyone remember something they've forgotten? Okay, well, thank you. We have online with us, let me see, uh, Josh and Hannah, I believe, are there. Yes. to speak with us about the Lakota Group State of the City presentation. And, and thank you both. Uh, I have been sending lots of people your, well, the website way to read that. And um, people <laughs> seem pretty happy about uh, being able to see it. So thank you for that. All right, there's Josh. And Hannah, hello, nice to see you both. Nice to hello. see you. All right, I assume we're gonna let you all proceed however it is you choose. Perfect, yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor and City Council for having us today. Um, I'm gonna share my screen quickly so we can jump into a presentation we pulled together. Can you guys all see? Can. Yes. yes. 
All right. Um, so thank you again for having us today. We're going to just kind of dive in here real quick. Um, we are presenting today the State of the City Report. So this is the, the existing conditions of Webster Grove. Um, and you guys all, all had a chance to review this. So we're going to try to keep the presentation a little high level um, and really talk about some of the key findings we've um, come to by doing an assessment and also listening to the community of Webster Groves. Um, and then we'll highlight quickly some of those preliminary recommendations we had outlined at the end of each chapter. Um, and this is really a draft of these recommendations. It's gonna be the starting point for us to kick off phase two and start um, testing some strategies and ideas with the community. Um, and then we'll save some time at the end for some questions and discussion with you guys. Um, I do wanna mention that Josh is here with us as well. He's gonna be do so doing some of the present presenting. Um, and we also have on our team, Manhard and Sam Schwartz, who were not here, but they were very integral um, in helping form this State of the City report um, and had a, a lens of mobility as well as infrastructure on those. Um, so just quickly highlighting um, what this report included, um, these first three chapters embarking on the journey about Webster and the voice of Webster Groves really kind of highlighted the planning process um, the why, the why for why we're doing a comprehensive plan um, and really showed a demographic profile of Webster Groves as well as the initial engagement we've done to date. So highlighting some of those key themes we heard from the larger community. Um, and then in those last four chapters dive into the nitty gritty of housing and land use and zoning as well as mobility and infrastructure. Um, so just a quick highlight before we go into that, just a reminder of what Journey to Destination WG is. So this is the new comprehensive plan. This is the update to that document. Um, what we're going to talk about today is just the where we are today, who Webster Groves is today. Um, but this entire process is working towards, is jumping into this journey to Destination WG. Um, and what this document will be at the end of the process is a strategic roadmap. The idea is to create a long-term vision looking out 10 to 20 years um, to help us guide growth and development over multiple different planning topics from housing to land use and zoning um, down to community character and the arts and culture of the community. Um, and this comprehensive plan is going to help gu guide um, and inform city decision makers when it comes to land use and zoning um, and how we can kind of look at our future growth and align that with the community's goals. This is also really trying to highlight the community vision. We want this to be as involved and reflective of the aspirations of the residents who are here today um, so that we can make Webster Groves um, kind of shine through on the strengths that already exist and really harness in on some of the things we want to change and um, see continue to grow into the future. And the Last thing I'll mention is this is also a flexible document and will be a flexible document. Um, we recognize that 10 to 20 years is a long span of time. Um, and we've looked uh, over the past 10 to 20 years, there were some things we could not predict. So we want to make sure that this document can evolve with the community's changing needs and adapt to the, a better future and the tomorrow. Um, so we're just gonna dive into the state of the city report. Um, just kind of quickly highlighting again, this is the State of the City report was just an in-depth overview of Webster Groves. Um, just kind of taking a look at the existing conditions um, of these various planning components and also integrating a lot of the things we've heard from the community based off our initial engagement. Um, and this document really becomes the foundation of the comprehensive plan. Um, so this document will help us start to build these goals and strategies um, and ensure that they're achievable um, based on the current conditions and also meet the aspirations of the community. And this is a three-phase process. Um, so we'll be working with the city of Webster Groves for the next year to year and a half. Um, and it, it'll span three phases. So this first phase we're in today um, is the engage and assess um, piece of this. And this is really about um, pulling together a full assessment of the community and um, ensuring that we're talking to the larger public and key stakeholders um, to really find these challenges and needs that are within the community. Um, so this is where we are today, and this will culminate with the State of the City report, which we're reviewing and we'll be sharing with the larger public and promoting as well towards the end of the month. And then the next two, oh, sorry. And the next two phases um, 
we'll really start to jump into the envision phase for number two. And this is where we're testing different ideas, different strategies um, to really get an understanding of what the community wants to achieve and how they wanna address some of these existing opportunities and needs. Um, and then after we've tested these ideas, kind of solidified them and found out what those strategies are, phase three will be really pulling us into the final report um, and creating this implementation strategy that really outlines the actions that'll need to be taken to get there um, and who the responsible parties are um, and how we can get there over the next five, 10, 20 years. Anna, I think someone wants to say something in the group. No? I think we're okay. Uh, Please continue. Uh, okay, and we should just okay. say it, it's a year and a, it's a year to a year and a half overall, but we're about halfway through that at this point. Yes. Thank you. I can't. For some reason, my settings are strange, and all I can see is the presentation, so I can't even see your reactions. So <laughs> please, stop, yeah, please stop shy. me. Okay, beautiful. Please stop me if I'm going too fast, um, and answer any questions you guys have. Um, so this here is just really quickly highlighting. Um, the work that has been done to date within the city, um, acknowledging that there's a lot of planning that has been going on and these are important plans to help us kick off the comprehensive plan. Um, so these, these are things that will be brought, brought into the comprehensive plan, um, things like the bicycle and pedestrian master plan, which really outlines some key improvements on specific corridors um, and how we can continue to make Webster Groves the walkable community it is. Um, highlighting the state sustainability plan and some of the strategic plans that outline um, community values as well as action items that the community can take to um, based on each department. So there's already an existing foundation of planning that we'll be bu building off of as we work towards the final comprehensive plan. Um, so now diving into section two, this, this is just really a highlight of um, Webster Grubbs location in the region, a quick snapshot of its local history, and we'll dive into some demo demographics as well. So just taking a look at Webster Groves in the region, um, Webster is one of 100 municipalities within the St. Louis County, um, and it is very close in proximity to St. Louis, the downtown area, um, and it stands out in the community for its architectural character. Um, it's uh, robust business districts um, and it's um, prime location in the larger region. So it's important when we're looking at Webster Groves that we're also recognizing how it can contribute regionally um, and kind of use some of those assets to help it thrive. Um, just a quick highlight of some of the, the local history. Um, Webster obviously dates back to the 1800s. Um, and has gone through a lot of significant changes that have brought, brought it to where it is today. Um, Webster, in the, about the 1850s, it um, really started with the railroad development to see a lot of spur and growth. Um, and it was the uh, introduction of the railroad that brought some of these business districts um, and really made it a place that was um, a commuter town and a bedroom community. Um, and it was with the railroad that came um, some different developments as well as the golf club, the, the golf club that um, kind of made it thrive and um, made it more of a place to live and work and um, has a significant impact on um, where Webster Groves is today in the region and how it is. Um, so now I'm going to let Josh jump in and talk about the community profile. Sure. Um, I don't think any of this will be any surprise to anybody. Um, Webster Grove's population has remained pretty steady over the years, um, and there have been no major jumps or declines. Um, and we can talk about some of the reasons for that, but it has it has really remained stable over this time. The um, uh, one of the things that came up multiple times in our focus groups, interviews, listening sessions um, was the uh, the value that Webster Groves places on diversity. Um, and there have been some shifts here over time. Um, the black population of Webster Groves is slowly declining from about 6% uh, 10 years ago to 5% today. And there's an even more dramatic decline in the black population in North Webster, um, which has been quite significant. 
Uh, you can go to the next slide. We compared the city to some of its neighbors just to see how, um, how different factors uh, uh, compare across these municipalities. So um, they are all, or almost all, relatively high income uh, communities. Um, and they are um, mostly highly educated communities. Webster Groves is particularly highly educated with 71% of the population having a bachelor's or higher. Um, and another common thread around most of these communities is that they are slow growth. Um, uh, the, the county overall is particularly uh, uh, um, uh, growing particularly slowly, almost not at all. Uh, Webster Groves has grown at an annual rate about four, uh, about 0.43% or about 4% over the last 10 years. You can go to the next. And this chart, the chart on the left, um, looks at uh, we, uh, um, the uh, age brackets within the Webster Groves population. Because sometimes you can see interesting things when you start to look for, you know, you can look at you can look at average age, you can look at um, kind of different cuts. But when you look at uh, how these age brackets break out, one of the things that you can see, and the purple line is St. Louis County, and the um, the orange lines are Webster Groves. Is that um, particularly in the uh, in the years in the ages from 25 years old to 44 years old, which are what we think of as like family family formation years when people are kind of uh, um, getting uh, uh, starting their careers, marrying, having kids, that there are fewer uh, households in that segment in those two segments, and we don't know exactly why, but it is reasonable to. Uh, into it that one of the reasons is that um, is that housing is expensive for young families. Um, on the right side, you're looking at employment of Webster Groves residents um, by industry. And I think the thing that's notable here is that uh, about 82, cumulatively, about 82% of the population is employed in essentially white collar uh, professions, which correlates to the high education levels. Um, you can go to the next slide. Ah, this is back to you, Hannah. Okay. <laughs> back to me, yes. Um, so the next section we'll cover just really highlights some of the community engagement that's done been done to date. Um, and it's important to note that engagement is going to be an integral part of the entire process. Um, uh, and the point of the engagement is to really kind of pull together some of the key community needs and issues um, so that when we're kind of forming this um, comprehensive plan, we're really addressing the community's collective vision. Um, and we're really shaping that based on who, who are the people of the community. Um, so this will be a part of all of the process, but what we're gonna highlight now is just what's been done to date. Um, so taking a look at um, the different modes and ways of getting engaged we've had throughout. Um, I would like to highlight first our destination ambassadors, which is a group of key stakeholders in the community who have um, become our plan champions for this. So we are meeting with them four to six times this throughout the planning process. Um, and really their role in this is to um, be our connection to the community. So they are advocating for this plan and ensuring that um, it aligns with the goals and values of the community and also making sure we're using them um, to connect us to different people in the community that we might not have been able to get to be a part of this process. A couple of other things to highlight are our project brand and website. Um, it's really important that we shaped a project brand that kind of differentiates this from other happenings in the community um, and really putting this on the project website. So we have um, tri transparent parent communication with the larger community and a space where we can put different resources um, throughout the process that give project updates. Um, a couple of other things that we've done um, during our first visit in June, we had a number of listening sessions. I think we spoke with over 100 people throughout those, and those were with key stakeholders from the school district. We spoke with you all. We'll be continuing those, as Dr. People mentioned, with um, high schoolers, as well as the larger community as well. Also during our visit, we hosted um, a conversations, which was a series of um, table discussions where we will, were able to talk um, 
in depth about some key topics, including neighborhoods and housing um, and the business districts in the community to kind of start our understanding of the community and help us build this foundation of knowledge. Um, and those were also turned into an online survey where we got roughly 250 responses. So trying to use as many different platforms, both virtually and in person, so that we can make sure that we're um, bringing to light the community vision. And we just wanted to quickly highlight some of the key themes that have started to emerge from those conversations um, and that will continue to expand on as we work towards different strategies and recommendations for the community. Um, the first one is creative economy. Um, we spoke a lot with the community about um, the arts and cult culture that are there, but also um, the entrepreneur entrepreneurial spirit that exists in Webster Groves um, and recognizing that there is a lot of um, local creativity that we should be supporting um, and continuing to bring to light. A neighborhoods and housing huge topic throughout our conversations, um, recognizing that the architecture and the beautiful neighborhoods are something that makes people, um, is one of the strengths of Webster, Webster Groves and brings people here both to visit but also to live. Um, but there were also some key issues within the housing um, as um, Josh had kind of started to mention um, just about finding different attainable housing for people who are trying to downsize um, or enter the community and trying to find more affordable housing. So that was definitely a topic that came up a lot. A couple of the other ones that came up were government efficiency, um, how we can become leaders in the region and really partner with some of the local communities around us to um, kind of increase our resources um, and provide more amenities and opportunities to our community members and also looking at ways that we can streamline some of our processes um, to just kind of have a more efficient local government. Um, within mobility and connectivity, a huge topic here was an appreciation for the walkability within Webster Groves um, and looking at ways that we can improve that and continue to build these connections um, and really strengthen the active, active transportation network that exists in the community. Um, and also address some of the issues that exist within that network. Um, another topic that came up in that was public transportation um, and how we can continue to use that, how we can continue to strengthen that resource so that it serves a larger portion of the community. Um, and these last two, culture and community and parks and open space, really acknowledged um, the identity of the community, um, the parks and open space resources that we do have, um, and really the pride that exists in Webster Groves. Um, so these were the overarching community themes that we heard, um, and we'll kind of build from these on our key strategies and recommendations as we move into the plan um, and really use um, the community's aspirations as our baseline. Josh, I think this is yeah. you now. Yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about housing profile and um, uh, and some of the things that affect that, if you want to go to the next slide. So there's about uh, 9,900 households in uh, in Webster Groves. Um, as, uh, um, as we, when I showed you the chart of that very stable population, one of the structural things that means that the population has remained so constant really has to do with housing and, um, and the fact that the number of housing units has remained uh, um, pretty stable over time. Um, the, the city has a, a, a hugely high home ownership rate of 81%, um, which uh, just for comparison, the national average is about 64 to 65%. Um, most of the housing in Webster Groves was built prior to 1959. Um, really very few units have been added since 1959 and even fewer in more recent decades. Um, and this, uh, you know, with with um, um, uh, this limited addition of new housing units, it has meant a couple of things. One, that the population really can't grow without additional um, without additional units to support that, and that uh, at least in the residential sector, um, the property tax base is effectively is effectively capped. Um, next slide. Um, this chart shows, and you can look at it more 
carefully in the report, but this chart shows a couple of a couple of factors in the uh, housing category, including the median home value for Webster Grove, St. Louis County, and neighboring communities. Um, the I guess it's the fourth column, which says housing affordability index. Um, this is an index that is based on a, a midpoint of 100. And uh, I don't know if this is intuitive or counterintuitive, but a number higher than 100 indicates increased affordability and lower than 100 in in indicates decreased affordability. Um, the, 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 the interesting thing about it is, or the sort of thing you have to consider in context is that it's considered affordable, Webster Groves is considered affordable to the people who live there. So the people who live in Webster Groves already have relatively high um, household incomes and this housing affordability yeah, index yeah. is based on that. Um, and then the last column is the percent, another way of looking at uh, um, uh, housing related to affordability, the amount of income that would be, that um, the median income household would spend on the mortgage for a median price home. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And um, and uh, this is also apparent just from uh, uh, you know being in Webster Groves and, and knowing it that it is primarily uh, the housing typology is primarily detached single family. Um, there are other types of housing in Webster Groves, um, and uh, um, uh, but there is kind of a missing middle, uh, which is as Hannah was alluding to the kind of housing that is accessible to people who um, uh, 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 have, you know, median paying jobs, things like teachers and firefighters and so on. Um, and on the right, you can see uh, just the the six different typologies of, of housing that we kind of lumped the um, uh, web scripts inventory of housing units into. And you can go to the next slide. And moving into a little bit about the, um, the market in Webster Groves, the economic base, um, what you're looking at in this table is uh, spending potential of Webster Groves households. So it's the uh, aggregate spending potential and then the spending, the average spending per household. <laughs> and um, something that uh, reports like this used to focus on a lot is uh, sales leakage. Um, and that has become less and less of a um, uh, less and less reliable as a as a data point because our spending is now dispersed in so many other ways and mm -hmm. so much purchasing happens online. Um, but it's safe to say that a great majority of the spending potential among Webster Groves households leaves the city simply because there's not. Um, uh, there are not big box stores and the kinds of uh, large uh, retail venues where uh, people would spend uh, um, a, a, a large portion of their of their uh, retail spending. Um, next slide. And that brings us to Webster Grove's really wonderful uh, neighborhood or, or downtown commercial districts. Um, the three, each of them has their own personality. Um, each of them has their unique uh, uh, physical and business characteristics. I think the thing to stress overall here is just what a wonderful position um, these business districts are in. Um, it is true, while it is true that they can't capture uh, a great majority of the spending of Webster Groves households, they attract people from outside the city to come to Webster Groves restaurants and bars and specialty stores. And if you look around St. Louis or around the country, I'm sure you are aware that most small business districts like these um, are not in the uh, strong position that, uh, that, that your business districts are in. Um, it's a real strength. And in the plan, we will, uh, we will address some ways to preserve that vitality and enhance that vitality. Um, next. 
Can I stop you just for one sure. moment, Josh and Hannah? We're, we're going to run into a little time problem here. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a room full of people waiting for us to uh, do Firefight of the Year, um, which we're supposed to do in three minutes. So if, if you'll let, if just hang on with us one second. I have a suggestion to make. We'll see if everyone in the room allows this to happen here. So could we, uh, Katie, Neil, council members, um, go ahead and hear the rest of this presentation in the new business section of the council meeting. We can do firefighter of the year and community input, and then we can do this and they don't have to wait around until after the meeting. Does that, is that right okay with that? Yeah. yeah. All right, so we're, if you don't mind hanging with us for 10 or 15 minutes, then we'll get back to you at that point. Okay, so we just hang on the call. If, yeah, yes, yes. It'll be the same call for our regular meeting. Please. Okay. Josh, now, we'll put you in attendee mode, just so you know, you'll pop in the old mode. Now, I don't know that this was a great place for us to pause. So if you <laughs> see a better place coming up in the next couple of minutes, we can do that as well. And I apologize. There's just a lot of people in there waiting for us. That's okay. Why don't I just go to the net to that next slide since it wraps up this section? Okay, so perfect. Too disjointed. Um, and so this slide and the next one, uh, which Hannah will get to in a second, uh, summarizes some of our draft uh, recommendations, and we will provide more detail in the actual plan, but ways to diversify housing products and incentivize, incentivize that housing diversity. Um, those are kind of the main themes. And Hannah, if you want to go to the next slide, and we will also talk about some of the other issues affecting changes to existing homes um, uh, about creating design guidelines, discouraging teardowns where it's disruptive to neighborhoods um, and uh, and these kinds of issues, which people brought to our attention throughout the engagement process. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's great. And again, I apologize to stop you in the, uh, or stopping you in the middle, but we promise we're paying attention and we want to hear the whole thing rather than have you just rush, rush through. <laughs> All right, so okay. we can we will just go to, we're, we're going to change location, so that's why it looks like we're leaving. We're not really leaving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, you know, I think George really takes up something. I'm going to say, I'm going to go ahead and All right, uh, welcome to the regular meeting of the city council. We welcome questions, ideas, and comments from persons in attendance. Uh, members of the audience may speak only when recognized uh, during our period for remarks from the community and visitors. And we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes in order to complete the agenda on time. We'd also like you to fill out a comment card if you'd like to make a comment um, and you can just submitted at the end here and we'll call on you at the appropriate time in the meeting. Uh, 
I think that's it. So we'll start with the call of the roll, please. Yes, Mayor. Mayor Arnold? Here. Council Member Bliss? Here. Council Member Franklin? Here. Council Member Smith? Here. Council Member Alexander? Here. Council Member Hickson Shepherd? Here. Council Member Hassmeyer? Here. You know what time it is? <laughs> so we uh, have the opportunity right now to recognize our firefighter of the year. Uh, and I'm going to read the proclamation. Fully dressed, ready to go. Good honor. Uh, so here we go. Proclamation for firefighter of the year. Whereas Brad Williamson has been chosen firefighter of the year for 2024 by his fellow firefighters. And whereas Brad began his career with the city in 2003 and has served in a number of roles, including firefighter, acting captain, senior driver, operator, and apparatus clearance lead trainer, apparatus committee lead, and internal fleet manager. And whereas Brad's role as the apparatus committee lead was instrumental in latter 2025 design and its purchase in 2022, as well as in the design and planning of the future fire apparatus. His role as internal fleet manager is crucial as he works to ensure a healthy fleet that is ready to respond to operational needs. And whereas Brad is also a creator, skilled craftsman and fixer. He readily works on various projects for the fire department on his time off. He has built a custom fire department podium for award ceremonies, fire department 4th of July parade floats, and a mini house training prop. And whereas Brad has demonstrated compassion, courage, strong leadership abilities, a solid work ethic, and a strong commitment to public safety, he is to be commended for making our community a safer place to live. Now, therefore, I, Laura Arnold, Mayor of the City of Webster Groves, on behalf of the entire City Council, wish to thank and honor Firefighter Brad Williamson for his exemplary service to our community and do hereby proclaim August 30th, 2024, as Brad Williamson Day in the City of Webster Groves. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I just want to say, Brad, um, again, much like the proclamation, you're a glue that keeps us together in so many ways. You keep us on the roads so we can deliver life-saving people and life-saving equipment on a regular basis. So thanks for being our creator uh, that makes stuff, creates stuff, fixes stuff. You're the go-to person that we call. So thank you for being you. Appreciate you. Glad you're All right, we will move to our next agenda item. Thank you all gentlemen for being here to celebrate your fellow firefighter of the year. Appreciate the work that you're doing and going to do right now, I'm sure. Brad, I forgot to let you say anything. Do you want to say anything? <laughs> All right, we will move to the next agenda item, in, item, which is remarks from community and visitor. I have two car, comment cards here. The first is from John Reeve. So John, if you'll come forward to the microphone, I think I turned it off. You may have to press the button so the green light comes on. And if you'll give us your name and address and you then have three minutes. My name is John Reeve. I live at 48 Mason and I've uh, been in the community for 26 years. Um, I understand that this, uh, the council will consider the TAC proposal and we've um, 
we're very much against the specifics of that proposal and on many levels. Uh, one in particular is that it seems to be focused on finding parking for students, even though it's positioned as a, uh, a citywide set of standards. Uh, all of the focus on what, who's, what neighborhoods, what residential streets are gonna have to carry the burden of that parking is all the streets around the high school. And those streets can't handle the, the, uh, the expected load of that. It's particularly strong in the spring when you know, more and more students turn uh, of age to park. Uh, and there are other solutions besides burdening the residential um, streets with student parking. And we've submitted other proposals, other ideas on how that need could be met. On another level, uh, the criteria for the parking, the street width, um, what those streets purport are purported to carry in terms of parking and traffic and uh, are to me, they, they don't make any sense. And we submitted a photograph of Mason. I don't know if that got distributed. It did. Uh, the notion that you can see in the, clearly in the photograph that, that parking on both sides of the street don't allow two-way traffic. And that's according to the TAC proposal. That's what's supposed to be able to car be carried on that street. So um, we ask you to um, basically reject the proposal out of hand. It's, it has no data behind it. It has no standards behind it. Um, and turn your attention to working much more diligently with the, the high school on finding real solutions to parking. Uh, I would all, also note that all the surrounding communities, whether it's Kirkwood, Clayton, Ladue, uh, Maplewood, Richmond Heights, none of those communities have this same issue. They all find policies and solutions to student parking. So does Webster Groves want to be the outlier? Uh, because you are the outlier now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next card is from Doug Stanley. Hi, my name is Doug Stanley. I live at 25 Mason Avenue. I'm here also to discuss the fact uh, Traffic Advisory Commission parking proposal and I'll keep this brief I I think that this is um, being presented as a city uh, proposal but I would um, urge you to realize that it's only about student parking that's all this seems to be a, a, about uh, today uh, Julie and I uh, actually were a, I, I was working from home took a little break and we walked around the uh, the grounds of the school and and the other parking and one parking lot had 26 open spots 26 another one uh had um i don't know 10 or so there's ample parking there for the students and secondly um we have presented to the school a number of alternatives to provide more there's room there for a uh, building of more lots for them um, the school is as we all know the the, the number of students um, is declining and so i think that the need will not be as great maybe it was uh, an example of today and uh, in the future part maybe it's because it was the first day of school and maybe they're only there for a portion of the day but um, I, it was real telling to me how how few, I mean, how how much availability there was to park there. And I would like for you to to consider that that this proposal is not about parking in the city in downtown. It's not a park uh, parking near the new um, hospital that's going to be built. Could have some problems there. Not around. It's not talking about. Um, at any of the parks uh, in overflow of the parks. It's just about the school and these students that have um, a, um, a desire to park um, in the residential streets that are really close by. And so um, that's, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. I'm gonna pass it. Do we have anyone online who would like to use the raise their hand function to be recognized and make a public comment? 
All right. Thank you very much. That concludes our public comment section. Um, we now are going to move to new business. And for those of you in the room who have an agenda in front of you, we had something in our work session we couldn't quite finish uh, addressing a uh, presentation about our comprehensive plan. We're going to pick that back up um, with Josh Bloom and Hannah Bader from the Lakota Group. Uh, I hope you are still both with us. And we'll finish that presentation and have some time for question and answer here with council. And both Josh and Hannah, thank you for your patience and your flexibility. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for letting us continue the conversation with you all. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen and pick up where we left off. Can everyone see that? Yes. Great. Cool. Um, so the next chapter we're going to just quickly highlight is the land use section. Um, so it's really important when looking at a city to understand the current land use and development patterns so that you can plan and identify for any future needs and where where that might um, where those new land uses might happen. Um, this also brings up a great opportunity to assess community identity. Um, a lot of the inbuilt environment um, is a key and critical component to the community character and identity of Webster Grove. So we'll quickly go through land use, zoning, some opportunity areas, and that character and identity. So just taking a look at Webster Groves when it comes to land use, which is the patterns of residential, commercial, institutional, um, industrial and parks and recreation areas within a city and where those happen. Um, Webster Groves is predominantly residential. As we know this, it's about 79% of its land area is for residential use and 68% of that is single family. Um, the other largest um, land use is institutional uses, um, which is about 7% of the land area. A couple other things to note are just the other uh, second largest category is parks and recreation. There are a lot of excellent and well-maintained parks within the city of Webster Groves, and that accounts for about 5% of the land use area. Um, and together, commercial and institutional uses is about 6%. Um, and that kind of relates back to the market assessment that we had um, done previously. A lot of that commercial area is within those business districts and along Watson Road, and those industrial areas are more to the north of the city. And when we look at that from a zoning perspective, um, it is very similar to what we're seeing in land use. Um, majority of the community is zoned for residential um, at about 89% of this, um, and the largest residential zoning district is the A4 district. Um, and, and what correlates also with the land use is this 6% that is um, zoned commercial and industrial for the areas. One unique thing about Webster zoning is the educational campus campuses, which account for 4% of the community. Um, and these designations are really about how we can think creatively about our education educational districts um, in their design and use, and also put some um, regulation and restrictions within those areas so that we can hide, have a little bit of leverage on what is happening within those districts. Um, we wanted to kind of point out a couple of opportunity areas that arose during our discussions with the community. Um, the first being the West Pacific area. This area has experienced some development pressures in the past. Um, and it came up in a lot of discussions as still a place that the community wants to see something happen here. Um, and one of the things about a comprehensive plan is really thinking about the different areas that have opportunity and coming up with a vision that aligns with what the community would like to see in certain places um, and creating kind of development principles and guideline for those areas. So if anything was to happen, it is a reflection of the community's interest for the, these areas. Um, so there was still recognition that there is potential for a higher and better use along West Pacific Avenue um, and looking at how the community can be proactive to kind of define what that vision for that area looks like and how it can further support the old Webster Business District. Another um, area that came up in a lot of our conversations was the Watson Road Corridor. 
Um, and this has a little bit of a distinct identity that contrasts with the rest of the community. Um, it is one of the high speed um, corridors in the area. It's a little less walkable as it is on the edge of the community. Um, and it does have a little bit more of that shopping center feel to this area. Um, and we heard a lot of discussions about the potential there to um, kind of have an opportunity to, to diversify some of those land use mixes um, and also create more of a walkable environment in this location to better reflect the Webster Groves community. And another opportunity area that came up in our discussions was the intersection of Marshall and Summit Avenue. Um, this is another um, little commercial district that has organically evolved um, with the pop-up of some local businesses in this area and how the city can continue to support this um, distinct commercial district um, through incentives and urban design to um, continue to make it a more viable commercial area. So these are three sites that we saw as opportunities to continue to explore in the comprehensive plan. And then just diving into the community character, um, there are a lot of built and natural elements that truly define Webster Groves and its character and identity, but there also are some distinct fe features such as corridors, the districts, the neighborhoods, and historic preservation that really um, strengthen this identity. Um, so the State of the City report Report really um, dives into each one of these assets to um, further describe how a, each one of these com components um, supports the community character and identity of the community and how we can look at different urban design enhancements to con continue to strengthen that. Um, and so as Josh had mentioned when we were going through the preliminary recommendations. Um, these are really just some draft ideas um, that came from the key observations and the key things we saw within the community and heard from um, local residents and key stakeholders. Um, and these are ideas that we will continue to evolve in the second and third phase of this planning process um, to look at how um, we can test different strategies to achieve and strengthen some of these needs in the community. Um, so specific to land use and development is really how we can foster more small business growth and economic growth through our zoning and our land use, and really how we can preserve this residential character, um, the architectural integrity, um, and some of that historical element to the community, um, and ways that we can look at our zoning ordinance and how we can review and mo modernize those. And also trying to address environmental sustainability um, and continuing to create this pedestrian friendly environment through our land use and zoning decisions. Um, so we're gonna jump in and highlight some of the mobility and connectivity key findings. Um, we'll go through some of the roadway network, public transportation, and the active transportation infrastructure. So just a quick highlight of the community. Um, as we heard from a lot of the people we spoke with when we were in Webster, um, Webster is very recognized for its walkability um, and its strong uh, sidewalk connectivity to these business districts and throughout the neighborhood. Um, but we're, when looking at statistics, we can see that um, Webster is still highly dependent on cars. 74% um, of the community who is commuting to work do drive alone, um, but we will note that also 16% work from home. Um, and as Josh had mentioned with um, a lot of the white collar jobs in the community, this is reflected in the work from home culture that has shifted with COVID-19. Um, also rec recognizing in comparison to St. Louis County, um, Webster residents spend a higher percentage of their annual income on transportation and have more house um, cars per household. And when taking a look at the roadway network, it's important to note that a, the city has jurisdiction over majority of the roadway network, um, except for Big Bend Boulevard, um, which is within the county jurisdiction. Um, so have Having this much control within the city um, allows for a lot of opportunity to improve the network that exists within the city um, and also work on partnerships with the different jurisdictions to kind of improve some of these um, issues that arise, such as the 
high uh, collision rates that occur on some of those county controlled roads. And when looking at public transportation, um, this came up a lot with it, within our conversations that there is public transportation within the community, um, but it is not always on the most reliable um, uh, schedule and um, does not show up as often as, it, as community members would like to see. Um, there are two routes that there's the 56th and the 21st. And when looking at it from just the stats, um, it is notable that um, Webster Groves households are with 95% of Webster Groves households are within a half a mile of transit services. Um, and those service routes in the larger region serve over 75,000 and jobs that are accessible within a 30 minute route. So um, there's definitely opportunity if those transportation networks are improved that they could um, significantly support the community and um, bring more people into the community as well as out. Um, and then just quickly hi highlighting the active transportation network, which is really the sidewalks and the bicycle infrastructure that exists in the city. Um, of the 119 miles of roadway, um, only eight of them have gaps within the sidewalk. So it is very walkable and there is a strong network. Um, but although there is a small percentage, um, filling this gap would significantly increase and improve walkability and connectivity in the community. Um, and a lot of those gaps that we did see through our existing conditions um, and site visits and also heard from the community um, are south of um, the interstate as well as in North Webster. So in it kind of improving those areas will um, make a stronger uh, pedestrian network throughout the community. Um, and the other thing to note with the cycling infrastructure is that there are um, some shares within the community, but the network as a whole is not fully connected and is not putting cyclists first. So looking at ways that we can um, kind of create more complete streets would um, improve the cycling that exists today in the community. Um, so just taking a, a look at some of those pre preliminary recommendations, um, they're really looking to address um, safety and connectivity throughout the community. So looking at how we might implement a complete streets policy, how we can look at some traffic calming measures and improving um, crossings to make it safer per, for pedestrians. Um, and also looking at the transportation ne network that exists, the public transportation network and how we might improve some of those um, access points. Um, and this also continues with looking at how we can also do in urban design improvements, um, like why, way finding and gateways to really connect the existing net roadway network that exists um, and looking at improving streetscapes and pedestrian zones to just make them more comfortable for walking and connecting to the different assets of the community. And this last section we'll go through quickly um, is really the community systems. Um, so this was looking at parks and recreation, um, some of the community facilities and services, including the arts and culture assets um, and the infrastructure system that, that really support the high quality of life for residents and make it a great place to live, work and play. Um, taking a look at this map here, um, there's 120 acres of open space within the community. Um, and if you look at the map on the right, this is really highlighting the distribution. So um, the level of service for these parks um, the smaller circles are showing the people who have um, or have access within a half mile of their home and the lighter red is showing within a mile. So about 58% of households um, can walk to a park within the community and almost 100% of the community has access to a park by car within a mile of their home. Um, so this is one of the things we note and from being there we heard a lot about the well-maintained parks. Um, and I think there's things we can do to continue to um, improve those park systems and improve connectivity to those assets so that all community members can have the capability to um, enjoy those outdoor um, open spaces. 
And this map here highlights some of the community fa facilities that exist in the city. Um, and we kind of broke those down into different categories. So there's the city facilities, which include, include the public library, public safety, city hall, um, and the amenities that exist within the city. But there also are many more. So we have our educational facilities from the school district to Webster University and Eden Seminary. Um, the many arts and culture assets the community provides from the performing arts theaters um, down to the arts galleries and the Webster Arts, which pr provides a lot of programming within the community. The other key um, facilities that offer additional services are the rig religious institutions, the Chamber of Commerce, and some of the emergency shelters that are in the community. Um, so it's these systems of both public and private entities that really serve the larger community. Um, and the plan seeks to um, support these assets and these amenities and look at different ways that we can continue to provide um, local residents a high quality of life. And the last slide I'll leave is the slightly boring stuff, but uh, as we look at a comprehensive plan, it's important to also look at our infrastructure and ensure that um, everything from our water to sanitary to energy and stormwater um, is continuing to meet standards and be efficient as we continue forward. So um, recognizing some different areas that experience flooding and how we can mitigate some of those issues through educational tools as, as well as infrastructure changes. So with that, I'll just highlight a couple of the community systems preliminary recommendations and leave time for questions. Um, but these recommendations really look at how we can strengthen the existing um, assets that we have to offer the community, um, really prioritize resource management and looking how we can support the parks district as well as our public safety um, and looking at how we can improve connectivity to the different assets and amenities and um, continue to foster the, the city of the arts um, and form some regional partnerships with um, different organizations to expand the existing services that are offered um, and continue to invest in the city of Webster Groves. So with that, I will turn it to you guys if you have any questions and then we can just talk about our visit that's coming up this week. All right, council members, questions? Hannah, I don't know if you heard earlier in the work session meeting, the topic of conservation districts came up and I was just curious if that came up in the listing sessions and what that discussion might have been about. Yeah, I think, go ahead, Josh, if you wanna to speak to this, I know it came up with housing. Yeah, well, you go ahead first then. <laughs> I, and, then yeah, I, I, and then I'll add something. Perfect. <laughs> um, I was just gonna mention that this came up a lot in our conversations just about the impact that teardowns are having on the character of neighborhoods um, and the affordability of housing. Um, and there was definitely interest from a lot of the people that we talked to of coming up with different strategies to address that. Um, so I think we didn't hear cons conservation overlays specifically, but I think that's something in this next phase we'll start to explore, um, test out kind of what that might look like and how it might be actionable for you guys. Yeah, and I would just say that the that conservation districts uh, specifically are probably more sort of uh, policy wonky than uh, most of our listening sessions were, but those concerns were expressed, if not the, uh, the model for managing them. And then um, I would also say, just based on the council's earlier conversation about conservation districts and if they would work and how they would work is that um, you might look to your near neighbor, St. Louis City, which uh, has, I forget how many, but dozens of historic and conservation districts, and they each have their own uh, um, um, standards. Um, and, uh, um, and they are trying to come up with a way to manage those standards in a more integral way because each of the districts is managed separately. So you can reach out to the uh, uh, Office of Cultural Resources and they can explain what they're working on. Thank you, other questions? 
I, I have I'm another not, one. Oh, please. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Whoever has one. Go for it, Pam. No, I don't need one. Oh, okay. Um, the other thing that came up was the West Pacific area. And it kind of came up in two ways in my mind. Um, one is, you know, as we know, we had, we, it's been looked at before. Um, and there has been some wariness that, that I've heard from business owners back, in, you know, a couple years ago about whether they should feel comfortable doing improvements. Do they have a target on them? Are they going to, you know, um, is, is it going to be kind of, um, you know, eminent domain or what, you know, like should they go ahead and improve in their properties or, or should they not? There was some hesitation to do that. So one of the questions that I had was um, how do we reassure, Do we, can we reassure people during this process and, and kind of what has your experience been when you have areas that are kind of highlighted in, um, but also you need, you know, it takes time for things to happen and you need the day-to-day -to, -day to happen and you don't want you don't want people to not feel comfortable um, working on their properties. But then also the mention of modernizing the zoning um, ordinances and how that might help. Cause that was another thing that came up in those conversations was um, could the zoning, the zoning's pretty patchwork right there. So could the zoning be a little clearer or, you know, there was even talk of like removing zoning uh, uh, restrictions at some point. But so how could zoning maybe play into some of these um, discussions as well? <laughs> um, well, I think to answer your first question just about that area, um, I think what came up in our conversations with a lot of people were just um, kind of a desire to ins to still want to see change and seeing that as a potential area that could experience that. Um, how we kind of approach opportunity areas when we're doing this is it's really trying to understand what is palatable in the community um, and trying to show a visionary idea for that area. Um, a comprehensive plan is hard within this because it's looking out 10 to 20 years in the future. So sometimes they can become aspirational. Um, but really what we're trying to highlight are some development principles that can help um, if this area was to grow or change, um, really define that. So I think if there's interest in maintaining some of those, those businesses, and that's what leadership, the community, and city staff would like to see in that area, we would ensure some of those development principles would allow for those businesses to continue, but also look at how we can improve some of the areas around it. Um, so I think that's kind of going to be something that comes when we continue the conversation and start to test different ideas for that area. Um, the hope is that it would reveal um, what is most suitable, both from a market perspective, but also palatability with the community. And Josh, feel free to chime in to that if there's anything else. Um, and yes, zone, zoning might be a tool that we suggest um, you consider to help you um, kind of turn that vision or what um, the de development principles we come up with that I, that for that area, turn it into reality and kind of make that change happen. And when we talk about community input, we, I just wanna make sure that we're also including in that community, that particular area. Um, Absolutely. Right, yeah. Thank you, yes. David, did you have something? Yeah, I was just going to ask, and something that I've always struggled with the understanding. So first, I want to, like that that slide that you showed about affordability, I just want to understand uh, from my own education, you're saying that the people that live in Webster Groves, it's affordable to those people, right? It's a weird, it's, it's a weird data point. But yes, the affordability is based on local median incomes and local median housing values. So, I mean, that's at least a, a good indication that uh, incomes in Webster Groves has at least stayed relative to the affordability of Webster Groves, those that live there. So take that data point for what it is. Now, I was going to ask you, one thing that I found really interesting was the lack of housing that has been constructed in Webster Groves uh, since 1959. And then we talk about infill housing and the complications and the problems that arise with that, including with affordability. How do you balance those two? Like, how do you balance the fact that we need a churning, like a stock of new homes and new homes in general with the idea of affordability? It's a good question <laughs> because, because new construction is inherently expensive. 
So um, I think we Webster Groves is not likely to uh, be a place where, um, you know, relatively inexpensive housing gets constructed. At the same time, there are um, there are gaps in the marketplace. There are people who are trying to downsize who can't, who want to stay in Webster Groves and they can't. Um, there are, uh, there's people who work in Webster Groves who can't uh, live there because there's not, because there's not currently a stock of the appropriate sized um, housing units for them, um, for young, you know, uh, uh, single, uh, you know, young professionals, young couples, um, people just starting out with like one baby, you know, that that don't need, that aren't yet ready to buy uh, a larger home. So it's just to say like, there are portions of the market that are underserved, but as you know, it's particularly hard to, not just in Webster Groves, but also in Webster Groves, it's particularly hard to create new units, right? And that's the thing that the plan should try to help to address. Thank you very much. This was a wonderful presentation. I appreciate all the information that you guys have collected and, and provided to us. Thank you, David. Related to what we were just talking about, about affordability and new construction was all of the renovations and additions considered in this data that you were reported to us? Can you say more of? A lot of people have been making large additions to homes, expanding the footprint, gotcha. two foot, you know, two story additions, yeah. et cetera. Was that accounted for in the idea of construction of not no, new uh, homes, but there's right. a lot of changing homes, let's say. Right. I hear what you're saying. So no, it wouldn't count changes to exit uh, um, in terms of units built per year, for example, it's not counting that data is not counting changes to existing homes, but it would count. Well, <laughs> it would consider a teardown and a rebuild would be a new home, but it's the same number. It, it doesn't change the number of units. However, that new unit would be, let's say a 2024 unit. A, you know, 2024 house instead of a, you know, 1939 house, for example. So there's no way, is there, there's no way to account for that construction? Is well, you can account for it uh, um, through building permits. You could account for the value of it, um, but it wouldn't change the, um, it wouldn't change the median home value or the affordability uh, data points. Okay, thank you. Does that answer? Yeah, yes. Okay. Um, so we, we do have a bit of a dilemma in that we, the affordability. And then when we talk about, you know, the, the new construction or either the communities where we have challenges with teardowns and what have you, I think before we broke, you sh the slides you were showing and we had to kind of rush through that and you had some summaries in there about preserving stock. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess, yeah, so the housing, yeah, yeah discouraging teardowns and um, implementing urban design improvements. And so, I mean, in there, creating design guidelines, I mean, to me, that's almost where that conversation fits in about conservation districts. Mm -hmm. and what have you and what we can do, but it's almost like we immediately say, well, you know, how do you manage that? But then we say here, we need to do something like that. Yeah, because we do. So it's, if we, if we're looking at trying to service our employees that work here and can't afford to live here or people that are trying to downsize and stay here. And I think this is some of the ways that we do it, but I think that wouldn't have um, looking at how the conservation districts could work and zoning to accommodate that be a part of that approach. Yeah. These are particularly hard conversations, I think. Um, conservation districts are one way to manage um, the preservation of existing housing. And often these smaller, older homes are considered um, Nat, you know, quote, naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, 
they are affordable by virtue of their size often because people want larger homes. You know, uh, the market often wants larger homes. So uh, um, preserving that housing that exists already is one way to at least preserve a uh, relative, some diversity in the price points of housing within the city. Karen, I just want, wanted to piggyback off that really quick because I, I think I think you were on council when we talked about the floor area ratio right. and we ch made changes there. I think that would be a good conservation, especially when we talk about affordability, like just looking big picture of how we can keep um, even new builds to be less expensive. Exactly. And, I, and I know I preach to the choir on this, but if we look at the architectural review board, I still believe that there's cost saving measures there that our ARB does not take into account. And I, and I do totally agree because that was one of the things that we even discussed the other night about the, uh, what is it, the floor area ratio? That was mm -hmm. but, but, but because even when we went in and we put some of those in place, they're still pretty large, you know? And if we're looking at some of these places where we have neighborhoods with smaller housing, then maybe the, the floor area ratio requirements do something to maintain the size of the housing stock. Exactly. You know, so, I mean, if builders want to go and build mansions, then they need to go where mansions are built, you know, as opposed to putting those in the middle of a cottage neighborhood where it then impacts the, their, their neighbors. I mean, literally the sun, the, 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 what have you, the wind, the access to elements that the smaller homes around them now have. So anyway, I'm again, preaching to the choir. <laughs> All right, I, uh, Hannah, I think you mentioned that perhaps you would give us a little bit of a preview of what's gonna happen in your visit. If you could do that briefly, we'd very much appreciate it. Yeah, of course, let me just share my screen real quick. Um, so just a quick highlight, we will be here this Thursday and Friday this week. Um, we are meeting with the larger community on Thursday evening to continue our listening sessions. Um, we will also be meeting with some high school students, um, and we will be giving a presentation to our destination ambassadors of the State of the City report. So this will be kind of the, the last touch point of the State of the, State of the City before we share it with the larger public on the project website. Um, and then we will be at the Old Orchard Good Gazebo music series, we'll be having a pop-up event. So we'd love to talk to the community, continue these conversations um, and continue to promote this um, state of the, uh, this comprehensive planning process. Um, and once we've made that state of the city report live on the website journey to WG, um, we'll start diving into phase two of this planning process, which is the visit visioning phase. And I'm sure we will continue to have these conversations of how we can bring some of these recommendations to life with uh, leadership, the larger community, and um, city staff. All right, great. Thank you, Hannah and Josh. Once again, thanks for your flexibility. We really appreciate this presentation and the work that you've already done and the work that's upcoming. So we look forward to hearing from you again soon. I'm sure you'll see a few of us Friday night at one point or another. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you right, so much. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to unfinished business. Councilmember Hassemeyer, could you call for the third reading of Bill number 9262, please? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor. Um, could could I, I'd like to call for the third reading of Bill number 9262, please. So the second. Second. Bill 9262, third and final reading. An ordinance granting a conditional use permit to the Peace United Church of Christ to allow a place of worship use in an existing structure on an approximately 16.23 acre tract of land at 47 North Bompart Avenue in the EC1 Educational Campus District and matters related thereto. Is there any discussion? <laughs> Let's have the vote, please. Yes, Mayor. Council Member Bliss? Yes. Council Member Franklin? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Council Member Hickson Shepherd? Yes. Council Member Hassemeyer? Yes. Mayor Arnold? Yes. Councilmember Alexander, could you call for the third reading of Bill number 9263, please? Yes, I'd like to call for the third reading of Bill number 9263. Bill 9263, third and final reading. In ordinance, permitting the subdivision of certain property, 439 Landscape Court in the A4 7,500 square foot residence district. Is there any discussion? 
All right, we'll have that vote then, please. Council Member Franklin? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Council Member Hickson Shepherd? Yes. Council Member Hassemeyer? Yes. Mayor Arnold? Yes. Council Member Bliss? Yes. Council Member Bliss, could you call for the third reading of Bill Number 9264, please? Yes, I would like to call for the third reading of no Bill Number 9264 and its subsequent adoption. Second. Bill 9264, third and final reading. In ordinance, amending the Code of Webster Groves, Chapter 10, Article 12, Parks, Section 10.1200, locations by renaming the Sculpture Park, 175 West Kirkham Avenue to the Jerry Welsh uh, sculpt, excuse me, Sculpture Garden. Is there any discussion? All right, let's have that vote. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Council Member Hickson Shepherd? Yes. Council Member Hassemeyer? Yes. Mayor Arnold? Yes. <clears throat> Council Member Bliss? Yes. Council Member Franklin? Yes. Councilmember Smith, could you call for the third reading of Bill Number Nine Two Six Five, please? Yes, Mayor, I'd like to call for the reading of Bill Number Nine Two Six Five and its subsequent adoption. Bill Nine Two Six Five, third and final reading, in ordinance adopting a revision and republication of the ordinances of the Code of Webster Groves, Missouri, entitled the Code of Webster Groves Twenty Twenty Four, and providing for the repeal of all applicable ordinances previously adopted, with certain exceptions. Is there any discussion? All right, we'll have that vote as well, please. Council Member Alexander? Yes. Council Member Hickson Shepherd? Yes. Council Member Hassemeyer? Yes. Mayor Arnold? Yes. Council Member Bliss? Yes. Council Member Franklin? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. All right, we'll move on to new business. Uh, we will start with our Director of Parks and Recreation, Scott Davis, on uh, new park design and naming. Good evening. So quick rundown of where we're at in this process with the uh, new park that we've been working on for a few years with Great Rivers Greenway. Uh, just for some of the public, you all got this in, in your background information, but uh, Great Rivers Greenway has purchased the parcel that was the former McDonald's property at the corner of Oxford and Big Bend. Um, the city has been working with them for the last couple of years on design of that park um, in conjunction with an extension of the Deer Creek Greenway which will go through Maplewood, uh, start in Webster, go through Maplewood into the city of St. Louis and connect to the River to Pear Greenway there. Um, once the park is built out, uh, GRG will donate the land and the park to the city. It will become uh, one of our parcels and one of our parks. And so we need to jointly name this. Uh, we started with the naming policy that came out of the Parks and Recreations Commission's naming policy. Uh, I submitted that to GRG uh, about a year ago, and they we tweaked a couple things so it aligned with their naming processes as well. Um, then we went out on a survey this summer to the public on naming uh, for this parcel, this park, and had a couple pop-up events around uh, both Webster uh, down in front of the Aquatic Center and at Maplewood Farmers Market. Um, had about 130 actual survey responses to that. Um, some of those were some pretty good names. Some of them were Parky McParkface um, or various other random names that didn't go well. Uh, the design, whoever submitted that is, I mean, it's very clever. I don't want to beat on them. They, they took the time to make the survey and submitted it. Thank you for that. Um, I got a chuckle out of it as you, always, you guys just did too. Um, so the design team took a look at all that data that came back in. We discussed some names, kind of narrowed it down a little bit. I submitted those uh, in that presentation, which is in your backup uh, packet to the Parks and Rec Commission at the July meeting uh, and had them take a look at the names. They recommend, uh, their recommendation was for uh, Oxford Bend. Bend Park. I was seeing it up there and it was backwards. I was like, ah, oh, it's not right. Oxford Bend Park. Um, their reasoning behind that was um, a lot of our parks have various names that don't really tell you where they're at and it's hard to find some of them sometimes so this one is very directionally named it tells you basically which intersections it's at um and nothing else there was nothing else of various historical background or anything along with that with this parcel to, to really get behind 
Uh, GRG also uh, approves of that name. They're wanting to take this to their um, board in September for approval. So what I'm asking for tonight is any discussions you may have around Oxford Bend Park. And if you all don't have any disagreements to that, I would like to get that on your agenda for uh, your first, second readings at your next meeting, and then potentially third reading at the following September 17th meeting. So that's my presentation. I'll leave it to you if you all have any discussions or questions. So it's not big Oxford. It's Oxford just, Bend Park. It's just Oxford Bend, not the big. Not No big. Okay. It's tiny. Yeah. Yeah. I just... That's where... All right, are we prepared to move forward at our next meeting on Oxford Bend Park? Yes. Yep. All right. Hold on. That, Scott, that's going to be the easiest we are on you in a long time. <laughs> Hold on, I was or, confused. So do, is there a name for the park? Oxford Bend. Park to be park based. I was going to say, I like that one a little bit more than Oxford Bend Park. <laughs> Oxford Bend. McBurglar. I, like I did like Nick Park or Hamburglar Park. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great it's idea too. Yeah. No. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our next item of new business, which is the Traffic Advisory Commission parking proposal. Since we have been presented with this proposal before, and this is um, the the TAC went back after some questions from us uh, and did some work on the proposal, and then have since submitted the changes. That's what you got in your packet. There are three things that um, the city manager and I discussed sort of what is it that we want to get out of this discussion today. Um, and there are three things, three decision points, I think. Um, one is, uh, would you like to move forward on some general framework, the general framework given here, um, and potentially then give staff the opportunity to do a little bit of work on more specific implementation? I think there's some implementation questions that, that they would like to work through a little bit, but the overall framework um, would move would move forward in that way. Um, and then uh, a significant question is, if this policy is adopted, will it be retroactive or will it be a decision-making framework moving forward where the ordinances that we have passed that restrict parking already remain in place? So this would be for new consideration if it is not retroactive. It was retroactive. I think we need to give staff, and, and, and staff's going to weigh in on some of this, by the way. And then the third decision is, if there is a decision to, to let staff work on implementation, can we establish a date certain for them to bring this back to us so that this isn't hanging out there for another set of months because the TAC has worked very hard over a very long period of time, and I think they would like some sort of resolution to this in the near future as opposed to the distant future. So those are the three things. And so I, the first thing I wanna do is, uh, it, that, that one, I already did stuff, that's not the first thing. Chris Redford uh, is here, Clark Hotelian, Susan Sunderman, Carrie Faulkner, all from the TAC available to answer questions. I know that Lieutenant Weimer is here to answer some questions as well. Um, and I believe we may even be putting our new director of public works potentially on the spot, because as I understand it, you have some background information from your time at U City about how to do these kinds of things. So council, there is ample, there are ample people here to answer questions. I have several myself, but I wanna let you all dive in first. So why don't we start by talking about any questions that people have specifically on the proposal that you need more clarification about? My main question is, can could we highlight what has changed in the proposal? Like, what's different in this than what we saw before? Uh, would one of you like to, to do that? Let me first say that that's challenging because this was a very wide ranging discussion that we had in response to your input from earlier and also as we, as we worked on this, we discovered that there were areas where we had different assumptions. So we had to, to work that out. But it's all, all of those changes are on the last page, and they all had to do with implementation. Is that helpful?
I, I'd be happy to speak to any one of those individually, but. Well, I one thing I liked about your first presentation is you had a very clear process on how to change the parking um, related to one street or another. Mm -hmm. And so has that process changed in your minds? I'm not really seeing anything related to process in this document. No, I believe our intent there has not changed at all. Okay, so the idea of so the idea of having a certain percentage of residents on the street would agree to a change, um, then it could, you know, we would have a certain path that yes. way. Yes. Okay. Yep. So that's still in place. Uh, <clears throat> were the did you involve the school district? On yes, this in proposal? fact, we spoke with the school district. Uh, early on and got a lot of input about the number of students who drive and how many parking, we counted all of the school's parking places at that time. And, and this has been two years ago. Right. Um, at that time, I think we were about a hundred parking places short. Since then, the high school has kind of did some research of their own and they're proposing to add a few so we don't need a hundred, but we certainly need more. Okay, so we've been in touch with them. Yes, recently, I guess. Recently, okay. So just as a, a, a general point of clarification, they have added to the lot one of the lots on um, Selma. Mm -hmm. um, they have gone back to the system in which they encourage carpooling in order to get a parking pass on their parking lots. And someone can help me with the third. There was a third, Clark, thank you. There's a third thing. Which I'm not sure they renewed this year because they, so the, go ahead. Yeah, oh, the, the third thing was that they're gonna do a ride sharing program. Yeah, but I don't believe they're renewing the lease at Peace Church this year. And that was temporary. Yeah. And, and but I, I think that it's, yeah. it, I think it's important to say this isn't a school parking proposal. And I think the two comments that were made earlier weren't quite accurate. This is really is a citywide um, proposal for areas that have, um, uh, you know, a concentration of could be students, could be shoppers, could be restaurant people. So this is something applied for the whole city. And to, a testament of that is Marshall Place, which has um, a lot of new parking going on because of the um, the coffee shop there um, asked for a temporary, um, looked at our plan and said, this looks great. They put a temporary in place and they're living with it. I mean, there, there's no complaints at this time. They're sharing the street with the congested people in the residence. And that's really the whole purpose of this plan is that in areas that are congested, there should be a, a protection to residents of some of the a portion of the spots, mm -hmm. but also sharing of city um, streets with those areas that are congested, whether they be students or shoppers or restaurant people. All right, thanks. Let's continue with questions, please. Uh, Mayor, a clarifying question regarding, I know like plan commission votes to recommend something and in your question for making um, you know, some of these suggestions retroactive. Mm -hmm. Is that something that the uh, Traffic Advisory Commission would recommend to us? And, or is that something I can just ask? Why don't you just okay. ask? May I speak to that? Please. Uh, I think retroactive is misleading. Okay. Um, we're not proposing anything retroactive. Um, what we're saying is that there are areas that are already deemed resident only and that over time, as the uh, Public Works has staff and funding, we would like to convert those to shared parking. But it's not urgent. Uh, it's not, unless a particular block came forward and asked that, the, that that move be made, mm -hmm. we would suggest just letting it happen a little at a time. So I'm going to ask, because I know that staff members have, the staff has a position on this as well. And so I'm, I don't know whether Dr. Peoples wants to address this um, or Lieutenant Weimer, who, who wants to address this? Because I know this has come up. 
It has. So I think Lieutenant, Lieutenant Weimer's the uh, correct person. And I did note that Councilman Franklin was trying to ask a question. I don't know if it was. Uh, David, can we have him answer? Does your question need to come before that? Uh, we can have him answer it. Okay. specifically what the PD stance is on the proposal in general? No, the question is we're discussing the issue of whether we go back to the ordinances that have been passed that have different kinds of restrictive parking in place right now. What is what is the PD's department, and I guess I'll ask you for the sure. other department's um, position about revisiting those prior but like decisions? I said, I'd like to acknowledge that the, the, the TAC has done a lot of work on this. And I really do appreciate the work they've done. I just don't know what that looks like from the police department standpoint, going back and, and changing some of those uh, permit parking. So our stance is, is, is kind of, um, I would like to see it as a guideline moving forward uh, for a future request. Okay. And you Thank have you, Madam input Mayor. from Public Works yes. as well. All of the departments have met and discussed this, and I, I too really appreciate the TAC's work on this. And I appreciate Mr. Redford saying that it's not necessarily retroactive. And I think that's a little bit of splitting hairs because looking back as we have time is still retroactive. So if that is something that council decided to do, what I would request that council consider is that we have some guidelines and prioritization from TAC for consideration. What our concerns were is how are staff to determine if we look at this block versus this block. So we'd really just like some more time, depending on what council's decisions are tonight, to vet what those processes would be. And once we hear more of this discussion, then we can really allocate staff time to it or determine what our staff allocation time would need to be. Because there's a lot that goes into repealing the ordinances, as, as you know, Madam Mayor, mm -hmm. and looking at... Um, notifying community members that it would be impacted, doing signage, uh, discussing enforcement. So there's a lot that goes into that. So again, if it were retroactive, we would like to know more about what that looks like. Okay, just mm -hmm. so I'm clear, because we have <laughs> a lot of words here. If I were to summarize very briefly staff and departmental input, it would be the first choice is not to have it go back to Correct. those ordinance. If we decide to go back to additional ordinances, staff would like some prioritization yes. information. Okay, just want to make sure I understood. Mm -hmm. So my the clarification and it, this sounds different than when I asked if it were could be responsive to neighbors wanting to change it. We're, we're saying yes. So what I love about this proposal is it gives people uh, residents that want to make a change as they as they uh, talked about Marshall Place visit. Prime example, we must have had 30 residents show up for a TAC meeting. And in that meeting, they all talked to us about safety concerns because of the two-way parking on the street and because cars couldn't get through and there'd be a length of 50 yards or so where, where cars had to reverse because they couldn't mm -hmm. get through. So this was a great solution for that problem. It sectioned off part of the street as permit, part of the street as one-sided parking. And so far, there have been zero complaints from anybody on Marshall Place regarding that. So moving forward, if there are other streets in the community that want to do this, they have a pathway to do so with a petition, uh, which would require 75% of the people okay. living in that street okay. to enact that petition. So, so could we eventually end up with uh, mismatched streets? I mean, street A, this block, they want this, and this block want that. I think that's what TA, TA, that's that's TAC's reasoning for um, wanting to eliminate uh, permanent parking and make it a dual kind of parking thing throughout the city. Mm -hmm. if, if I could respond to that, kind of would you would you step a little yes. closer to the microphone? Thank you. So let me clarify that. Some of us were kind of giggling when people said that. That is the situation that you have today. Every block block by block by block is different. Every one of them. It's a hodgepodge. Mm -hmm. One of our goals with this was to try to standardize the way that the parking is treated, not just around the high school, but throughout the city. Mm -hmm. So we think that's an important element of this. Okay. So <clears throat> if we did, like I said, we do have that situation already going, 
Yeah. So if the street in the middle of that hodgepodge wants to change it, will we go to the other? Would you recommend going to the other ends of that street to say all of you have to change, not just this one? Well, that that's not uh, up to us. I mean, we we urge the city to make this um, this change and and to implement it over a reasonable period of time. Um, but that, frankly, is is your choice. So if I might, if I might interject for a minute, Emerson, given my conversations about this with the city manager, I think those are the kinds of questions that staff would like a little bit more time to figure out the nuts and bolts of implementation. Is it one block segment at a time? Is it, you know, a right. natural contingent of blocks? I, is that a fair characterization? So, I, so those are the kinds of things I think that staff wants a little bit of time with if we at least in principle agree with um, a uniform standard. Good, because I think I read somewhere where a resident can start that process by themselves. Again, may I clarify? Yeah. <laughs> there are two pieces to this. One piece has to do with the, the width of the street and, and has to do with safety. And our recommendation is that even one community member could ask for that change because that change is about safety. The other half has to do with shared parking and the shared parking one requires 75% of the block to request it in order for it to be approved. That's a good clarification, thanks. Yeah. And the person who can request on the former is somebody who lives on that block or anybody in the community? Actually, many of our streets are arteries that lead from someone's home to uh, Lockwood or someplace like that. So it seems reasonable that the user of that street should have the right to request that change. If they can't get through, That's a, they want to get that repaired. No, I understand. I think yeah. that was a question we had on the previous presentation. So so anyone could could request it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So assuming that this goes through, I mean, couldn't we do something along the lines of how uh, we do our mill and overlay and do it by quadrants and the city looks at a quadrant a year and implements this policy in each quadrant for four or five years? I think that's a terrific solution. We did not want to try to impose that solution on the staff. Um, you know that's that's not our our uh, our our place. So I'm I'm gonna if we you don't all don't mind gonna ask um, uh, our new director of public works, uh, Mr. Alpaslan. I you're gonna have to say it for me a few times. So I I don't want to uh, you if you guys would mind just stepping for a moment. I I understand. Yeah, I mean, there's there is no rest for the weary. Please come on up to the microphone, and please will you correctly pronounce your completely correct. Oh, I wow, um, you as I understand it, you have some experience with these kinds of proposals, and and the city manager let me know that you might have a few things to tell us that we should maybe consider. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Mayor Arnold, uh, members of the council, uh, there was uh, in University City, our implementation included a, a residential parking permit. And so uh, I don't know if it's uh, fully applicable in this case uh, because it, it's, it was in the name residential there. So the, the, it was to protect the residents of the block to be able to uh, use uh, utilize that block for parking. And so there were areas near uh, uh, large institutional use there, as you know, Washington University, and then uh, the border areas of the city where uh, we bordered with Clayton, especially those areas, there was some, uh, some traffic shifting from uh, those other areas into University City. So there were certain areas that were uh, that uh, this request had to be in uh, to be qualified to to begin with. And then uh, the requester, it was a request-based process. And so the requester uh, would need to be a block resident. And so the requester would come to our traffic commission, make this request. 
And so that was by the way of a, a filling out a traffic request form uh, that would actually go to staff. Staff would analyze that request and look at available parking in the area, driveways, whether driveways and uh, uh, parking was available uh, on the residences. And then uh, would it qualify for that criteria that I just mentioned? And then uh, bring this uh, with their recommendation to uh, the traffic commission uh, and the petition, well, uh, in this case, the requester would also attend that meeting, discuss uh, this with the traffic commission. And then the traffic commission, based on their uh, decision, they would determine an area that they we would call affected households. Uh, and so the affected households then becomes the uh, the denominator uh, for the petition. So then the 75% uh, was also what we implemented uh, would be the petition. And in this case, the requesters and the requester became a petitioner uh, and their responsibility to uh, bring that uh, many uh, uh, signatures, uh, collect the signatures and bring it back to the traffic commission uh, for, uh, for approval. Uh, so that was our process uh, in University right. City. So it sort of, in some ways, kind of changes the order here. So okay. you're defining whether the street is suitable for that before a, a resident goes out and collects the 75%. Right, and, as well as determining an affected household's area. Uh, so we so did that's this. that's defining, I think, what Emerson's question was. We did this on uh, one side of the street before, uh, and we even once, I think, did this on one quarter of a block. So it was like just one uh, side of one half of a block. Uh, and so, okay. uh, yeah, that became a little complex. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. This is, I start getting into, I'm probably getting in the weeds because I start thinking about biz, other permit type parking, but this is only, free residential parking, correct? Well, it's the way we share the parking that's okay. available yeah. in areas where the, the neighborhood butts up against a, a, an institution, a school, mm -hmm. a restaurant. Um, and so the, we have two groups of people who are trying to share the available parking. And so we're trying to find a way to fairly do that. Okay. But I think your question is, is the, if you think of Old Orchard, for example, yeah. we've got some bomb part restricted business parking there. We've got Lake uh, and what is that little dead end street? Well, there's a, yeah. a whole stretch of Lockwood yes. that is got business right. parking, but is not utilized because mm -hmm. there's there's 20 spaces and two cars that park there. Yeah. So it's, I'm and, glad you brought that up. We I, That's one we should revisit. And there are some locations in the city that uh, had the restrictive parking because of Nerick's and Webster University. But now that they have ample parking themselves, those signs are still in the neighborhood that could be freed up. So um, I have a question that I r would like actually both a staff perspective and a, a TAC perspective on, and I'll just, I don't really care who answers first, but, um, you know, in, in the Traffic Advisory Commission, one of the things that I think everyone wants to work through is what comes to the Traffic Advisory Commission versus what gets uh, resolved by staff, how much additional input TAC has on some of these things. And so one of my questions is, if a policy like this were to be adopted, what is the expectation about when a petition comes in? Is it to be administratively staff, goes through the process and looks at, at the policy that exists and does the implementation? Or does TAC play a role in deciding whether or not this is an appropriate place to do this even after the policy is in place? I think we should make that decision, Laura, as a council and just say it should be a staff decision. And if, the, I mean, the TAC should be notified and they don't like the decision, then they can go about their process. But I don't think we should let the, I think it should be a staff. It should, this should be based off of expertise. Oh, I think we're getting a TAC answer to my question. Carrie Falgenrath, so I've, um, I've been on the TAC about as long as Chris has. I will point out that as of right now, the process for a stop sign request the city has a policy in place 
uh, those stop sign requests come to us as TAC and we look at them, we request traffic data, um, and then we compare that information against the policy and we put a recommendation forward. So I'm not saying which what the process should be for this, but I am saying that we already have a model and it already comes to us. So if if that is not the model we want to use, then we should look at all of all of those proposed policies and not just parking. Only only some traffic like stop signs come to the TAC. Otherwise, if it's a cut and dry thing, the police officers or the police and public works can do it independently. If it's a safety, yeah, please use the microphone. If, if it's a safety concern, then then it becomes something that we we address through public works and the police department. Yeah. Uh, if if it's a clear cut thing, if it's if it's something where we need to collect additional data data because it, uh, they're saying traffic volumes and things like that, then that's the process that usually happens. Yeah, and, and part of the confusion here is if you read the TAC statute, it doesn't really say. And so, and, and I'm not sure that we have a really good historical record of what has come and what hasn't come. And, and so that's, I think, part of what TAC and staff members are trying to unwind here is how do you sort out those things? And so that's why I asked it, because I think if we're going to adopt any sort of policy, we ought to know what that's going to look like. And maybe that is part of staff recommendation with um, implementation as well. Um, so I fully agree. Um, being the new liaison, some of that role has been a little bit, you know, a little bit unclear for me. And I think we're working through it. I think to yeah. Dr. Peoples' point, I think that merits further discussion. Um, with staff to figure out how that process is exactly going to work because I don't even think TAC members are they they they, they ask me like how this is supposed to work and so there is confusion there I yeah. wholeheartedly agree with you yeah. thank you and I think on the width part I think we were pretty clear that that would be a staff thing so if somebody came forward and said hey we think there should only be parking on one side that's set in stone on terms of the width of the streets. So the staff would go out. I think I think that was in our. our it, the, the proposal report. does say that staff would determine. The staff the would determine, and they would put the signs up. But in terms of the implementation implementation of the other part, I think we're open for whatever works best. Okay. Thank you. There's one. There's one other thing that makes the um, the shared parking a little more complicated. The shared parking depends upon what's causing the problem. In the case of the high school, it's that the students are there all day. But what if we're talking about a restaurant? Well, that might be only affected in the evening. Or if it's another, uh, maybe it's a hospital. A hospital, you might want uh, more than just the daytime because you have evening visitors. So now that time may stretch into 10 o'clock at nine, 10 o'clock at night. So that one we have to kind of look at on a on an item by item basis. So Chris, that that sort of contradicts the general argument. I mean, you know, this policy is, as I understand it, supposed to be a uniform policy, but I think what you just said means that we have to look at the environment of the actual street itself. So we have Mason Avenue residents here and I will for full disclosure also say I live on Mason Avenue. I say this every time it comes up so no one <laughs> should be surprised. Um, we talked a lot about if you apply this to Mason, you've got the issue of Holy Redeemer access ways there. Um, and, you know, sometimes you have library parking around the corner or whatever. So, so I guess this is my fundamental question. Is this to be uniform or are these basic guidelines that then staff should use to do the best they can to meet the guidelines based on the situation presented to them? I believe the best way for this to work if we knew that we could apply these shared parking 24 seven, mm -hmm. then this becomes really simple and we don't have to be involved at all. The staff could do it. But we know that people are very protective of their parking along their streets and they may want to have the ability to park on their street after five o'clock if it's a school. So, we don't quite know how to handle that one. Okay. Thank you. That's that's the fact. Yeah. It, it's complicated. That's yeah. the bottom line. Um, other questions from council? I have no questions, but it's, I think uh, 
city staff should take a look at it, and iron out these uh, wrinkles before we start taking any action. The implementation. The implementation portion, yes. Okay, is is that a, so that would be to question number one, that would be a yes, let's look at going just a general sort of framework with the implementation decisions. Right. Because So of the three things I decided, that's number one, or I asked that we decide, that's number one. Are, are we okay? I'm not clear what, what could I try again? Please. I mean, that was clear as mud to even myself and I said it. So the first question then is, do we feel like there's enough merit in the policy as the, the overall policy to hand this now to staff to look at the details of implementation? Yes. yes. And then it would come back to us and we could decide if we wanted to agree with that or make changes from there. Right. Correct. And, and city would determine if it's a safety issue because everything is based on it should be case by case. Okay, so that again, I think that is a discussion after we see the implementation portions of this that they would like to clarify. Well, that's what's in there. Yeah. yeah. Question number two then is, and this is a specific request from staff that we give them guidance on this. Do we think that we want staff or do, do we want staff, not think, do we want staff to come up with a plan for impl implementing this where current parking restrictions already exist? We've used the word retroactive, whether you like that word or not, that's kind of the summary word. The alternative is to say, this is the policy that we would use going forward when new requests come forward. I think a holistic approach would be better and just look at it all. That's my point of view. Okay. So, I, but, but so, so I, I just watched the city manager perk up. Did you want to say something? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I heard him. Okay. Yes, go ahead, David. Uh, I was just going to say, I kind of agree with Pam. I think let the city staff come back with us with recommendations on implementation. I don't think this has to be uh, hastily done. I think I, I'm okay with this taking a couple of years. I, I also recognize that, you know, if there's priorities, then we can make priorities, but I'm okay with us dividing up the city in some fashion and, and doing this over multiple years. How does that work with uh, ordinances that are already in place? Like, would those all have to be... We would have to repeal repealed? them all and replace them. And they would be repealed one at a time? It depends on how we did it, if we did it. You I mean... You could do it in a larger group. Uh, you could do it in a larger group. I mean, I yeah. do see the concerns where we have parking restrictions already in place that have been there for a while and now we're talking about 20 years 25 years for changing some those yeah. pretty considerably um I, but, I do hear those concerns perhaps i mean things have changed in 20 years like the parking garage that was built and i'm just using the high school as like the example piece here i know that this would impact um other business districts and such, but living near the high school, I live on Swan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, there's a lot of parking, but also, you know, the kids need to get to school, you know, and I definitely think that there's an opportunity to work with the school district as well, you know, as we've discussed this and have been, the conversation has been evolving. I just think that looking back and saying, oh, well, things may have changed in 20 years is probably pretty fair. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I will say I, I believe the school district has done what they're going to do. I We have had many conversations with them, and I'm not sure that there's anything more that they intend to do. But now, let's not discount the fact that the TAC moved them. I mean, after six years of at least me being on council, we try to get the school district oh, involved. I, I'm, and I'm props not... to the TAC for getting them, uh, the school district to respond in some fashion. Oh, David, I didn't mean to discount that at all because you're right, it's huge. We They did things that none of the rest of us could get done. So thank you all for that, absolutely. Um, but I just think our discussions with the school district have reached a place where they've said they've done what they're gonna do and have kind of left it to us from here on out. All right, so 
I'm not quite sure. I haven't heard from everybody in terms about the retroactive. I, I, Jamie, Pam, Emily, Emerson. Retroactive? No. Okay. If somebody want to make a change, they go through the process, whatever, whatever however that might look. Karen, would you say that into your microphone? <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry to make you do that, but um, and and I actually am on the and and I'm I'm. <laughs> I, I disagree with the retroactive as well. And, and mostly it's because I'm worried about how much, I, I think we're underestimating the amount of staff time this is gonna take. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I may be in the minority here. And so there may be then a process that staff comes up with, but I do think given the fact that we are understaffed in public works and we are constantly trying to hire police officers to, uh, to dedicate time to doing this, is making a choice and um, we can make that choice absolutely, um, but I, I'm a little worried about what that looks like over the long term. And impact is important. And I think we respect that. And who knows, maybe the labor market will get great, but I, I'm not holding out hope. So I think we're gonna have to vote on whether or not we want staff to come up with a plan that may be applied retroactively, right? Isn't that where we are here? Because there's enough of a division here, I think we probably should actually do that. Because I don't want I don't want staff to go through the process of coming up with that unless we have a clear statement with the majority of council that they want that. Do we need? I, to, sorry, David. Do we need to determine implementation? I, which needs to come first? I'm going to let the city manager speak to that. <laughs> Thank you, Councilwoman Hasmeyer. I'm not sure I understand the question. I guess I just like. What needs to come first? Like, does staff need to assess this policy that TAC has worked on and just dis like discuss and say, okay, this is how this could be implemented. And would that include going, you know, looking at things retroactively or? Thank you. The decision on whether this is retroactively applied or not impacts how we discuss implementation and the plans we make. So we really need that decision making before we move forward. Thank you. I mean, there's two parts of the process. There's planning and then there's implementation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. One's on paper, one's very physical. So it requires a lot of work. Dr. Peoples, can I ask yes, a sir. quick, uh, uh, just a generic question about uh, the process? Do we think that there's a lot of streets that need this implementation? Oh, thank you for that question, Council Member. Like, assuming I, this were to pass, I mean, sorry, I cut you off there. I'm sorry. I might no, have it's later. a great <laughs> question. I, I don't have a percentage in mind. Oh, here's a TAC person. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not implying we have a percentage. I will point out the point you made, Emerson, about uh, the whole area that's impacted by, say, where there used to be a need for Webster U Narex parking that is gone. So if this isn't retroactive, then that stays forever. And as you just mentioned, it's not really relevant anymore. But what we did look at when with this started with a conversation, basically of that whole area with all of the student parking for all of Narex High School, Webster. And within that area, there was probably, probably about 20 streets and street segments. Um, but that was definitely the concentration that we found within the city, so. Could the staff implementation recommendations include, we really think we should include these particular streets as part of this? Like maybe we're not, maybe we don't make a blanket oh. all or nothing, but maybe the staff were like, we should apply this to these streets that already have a patchwork of permits. Or we know some of these streets or we we're know solved. that as soon as we say we just need somebody to say, please look at the street, that somebody is going to say, please look at the street. I mean, not going, if anybody can ask for a street to be looked at, that's going to happen immediately for all these streets. But again, that my understanding is that safety, not parking that's restriction. Like width. That's not repealing an ordinance. Yeah. That's really just the width. I mean, it parking. might be, but okay. not likely. But I think your point is good that those people around the city who feel that their street is narrow and too narrow to drive on, you're going to hear from a lot of people. Did you have? Uh, yes, Chief Ellis. 
please join our join our conversation here. I would say that from my perspective, as I when the TAC presented this, uh, I thought it was one of their strongest presentations. And as I supported that with the safety in mind that they were taking into account the parameters of the width of the street. That is our primary concern for accessibility for operational delivery. And so I think the parameters are there. So you can almost identify what I would consider the high risk streets based on the width they've come up with that exists. Because clearly that we have some very narrow streets that are very difficult for us to navigate in our apparatus when there's parking on both sides that's permanent. And those are high risk for us to the point where fire apparatus and ambulances can't get down the street. We have to back up and go a different route. So I, I believe from our risk assessment, they've identified with these different models based on the width. And I would use that as probably a starting point to identify the low hanging fruit of what streets would we address first would be some of those our most narrow streets that are most critical for this from the safety aspect of it. Chief, you bring up a good point, and I just have some personal experience because I live on Elm Drive, the street that they use for Firehouse 2 to get into the garage. And if there's cars parked on both sides, they can't go down Elm Drive. And Elm Drive's a pretty wide street, but they still have problems getting down Elm Drive. It's tight, but um, but again, I think that they've established the parameters based on width. So, Okay, I think we've been at this quite a while, and I think, so. so I, the question is, trying to figure out where we leave this. It looks to me if, and I don't think we have to have a formal vote, but. I'd like to say one more thing. Please do. Formal vote. Um, I think the TAC has created standards. Looking at something holistically is more efficient than addressing things piecemeal. There becomes a lot of confusion. What are we applying here? You know, when was this? Oh, we did this here and we didn't do this here. We just take a overall comprehensive look in my point of view, it's a lot e easier. And I've done work like this and it's just, it is easier and more efficient. And I think maybe a timetable, if you do take a holistic approach is fine. I mean, I don't think anyone wants this to happen overnight. I mean, it can take divide it by four years or five years or yeah. whatever to implement. I think, so, oh, go ahead. Well, I'm really trying hard to wrap this up. <laughs> so if you guys, we, I think we've had enough questions and answers and and I, I don't mean to cut you off but I feel like perspective is pretty clear so it seems to me at this point that are, there are at least four members who would like to entertain the idea of looking backwards as well as forward in implementing this policy so that the direction to staff would account for that is that true all right is that clear enough instruction looking backwards or something's already on the books. Yes. And making changes. Yes. And Emerson, I know you disagree with that, but you and I are outvoted here. That's all right. So I mean, I'm just saying that's my yeah. you know. I think we're gonna be opening up uh, the can of worms, I guess, with everybody's gonna want their street. So so let's let's not have this conversation one more time right now. Let's let staff do some work on implementation. I thought it was you and David and Pam and uh, did I misunderstand what you wanted to do? I don't think I made a decision. Oh, I apologize. Because I came up <laughs> first and said, yeah, that I saw that that was problematic. Well, then you're the you're the swing vote. So make a decision, okay, please. The swing vote if you want me. <laughs> um, I mean, we can. Can, can we ask? administration to look at it bring something back to us because it's going to impact the yeah, work I mean, Wait, the that's that is, the details that's what we're that doing is, yeah that's exactly what we're doing administration asks us to maybe make that decision if we could it's clear we can't <laughs> no we we can do this we can make this decision let's just vote on it i'll move i'll move that we apply this retroactively and make everyone vote on it <laughs> but like what does that mean i second it you know uh, I'm getting hung up. I'm getting hung up on the details. Not you are. Like, not now, the remember, well. remember that this is the uh, David. May I clarify? A, have a clarifying yeah, question. Absolutely. Is your motion that the I, at this point we don't have an actual ordinance or anything, a final prop policy in front of us. So your motion would be to direct staff 
to consider implementation, including retroactively. So we Absolutely. will still see this before. That. Okay. Yeah. Is that clear as mud now? It okay. Is. We had a motion. Pam did second. Yes. So we really do have to have a vote now. Council member Hickson Shepard? Yes. Council member Hassemeyer? Yep. Yes. Mayor Arnold? No. Council member Bliss? Yes. Council member Franklin? Yes. Council member Smith? No. Council member Alexander? Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Is it, are you are you as certain about what we're doing as we are? I think you're, you're making the right step. Yeah. To at least look at it, listen to what staff has to say. It's, this is yeah. important. To your vote. So the, now we get to the last thing because we do not want this to go on forever. Because as as has been clear already, it's been more than a year. So what is a reasonable deadline for us to have this back on council's agenda? I would like to confer with staff and have a conversation with you and get back with the council okay. on that. But is it fair to say it will be this fall? No, we're not gonna say that yet because she's... <laughs> All right, as, as soon as demonstrably possible. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. I, I... I'm, I'm trying, I, I'm trying. May, may I say, I want you to understand my no vote was not, I didn't like your proposal. It was just okay. implementation we, of it. We still have some other things Many to finish. Thanks for your, for your patience. Well, thank you all thank for you your work. work. <laughs> I don't even know where my agenda is now. <laughs> piece of paper up here. To, uh, uh, ah, here we go. Agenda. All right. We have next before us the approval of the consent agenda. Is there anything that anyone would like to remove from the consent agenda? I, it, I'm sorry about this, but I do have one question for Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis, we seem to be applying for a lot of municipal park grant grants, and I'm not quite sure how all that works together. And can we all get all that money in one year? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> uh, the construction grant, the big one for $525,000, 99% confident we will get that this year. We haven't received one in several years, we could typically get those every other years, just based on our population size of Webster groups alone. The planning grants, you can officially get one per planning cycle. The planning, the cycle starts August 30th. I'm hoping to get one in this year in this planning cycle and put one in for next year for next planning cycle. I don't know if that'll slide through or not. So we might only get one of the planning grants okay. uh, for the $10,000, uh, in which case we'll just do the other one out of pocket uh, with Prop W money and such. Um, but if we can get both of those, we will. Okay. I'll apply for both of them. We'll see where it goes. Okay. Nothing but a try. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think we are to Councilwoman Hickson Shepherd. Would you like to call for the approval of the consent agenda? Yes, Mayor. I'd like to call for the... Um... Approval of the consent agenda. Second. Council member Hasselmeyer? Yes. Mayor Arnold? Yes. Council member Bliss? Yes. Council member Franklin? Yes. Council member Smith? Yes. Council member Alexander? Yes. Council member Hickson Shepherd? Yes. All right, we've made some appointments to boards and commissions. Brandy Grant has been uh, appointed as an ad hoc member to the Police Community Engagement Board. Kevin Randich has been appointed to the Traffic Advisory Commission. At least we're getting you another member out of all this. Jason, <laughs> Jay, Jason Vassar Elong has been appointed to the Historic Preservation Commission. Tara Shear is appointed as the School District Representative to the Parks and Recreation Commission. Michael Johnson has been reappointed to a second term on the Parks and Recreation Commission as well. I believe that brings us to adjournments. I, I did that really fast, so no one could Thank say you. anything. <laughs> right? We voted on the consent agenda, so we're free. All right, we stand adjourned then. Okay.